Commissioner Kent. Here. Commissioner Martin. Commissioner Price. Here. And Chair Beal. Here. Okay. So, um, we begin these meetings, as always, with the following land acknowledgement, which will be read at the beginning of each City Council meeting and advisory meeting per Albany City Council Minute Action, November 15, 2021. The City of Albany recognizes that we occupy the land originally protected by the Confederated Villages of Lejeune. We acknowledge the genocide that took place on these lands and must make strides to repay the moral debt that is owed to this indigenous people, specifically the Olone tribe. We thank them for their contributions, which have transformed our community and will continue to bring forth growth and unity. The city of Albany commits to sustaining ongoing relationships with the tribe and together build a better future for all that now make this their home. Uh, and then on to item number two, approval of the minutes for November 10. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes? Motion to approve the minutes. Second? Second. And um, can we have a roll call vote? Commissioner Abbott? Yes. Commissioner Armendariz? Yes. Commissioner Kent? Yes. Commissioner Price? Yes. Chair Beal? Yes. And the minutes are approved. Okay, um, public comments. Do we have, I don't see anyone in the audience tonight. Is there anyone online that wants to comment about something not on the agenda? Yes. Sorry, yes, we do have a, a one comment at this time. Jeremy, I, I, I don't have permission to let him in. Oh, I have to, I have to, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, formality, yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you. you. Good evening, uh, Parks and Rec and Open Space. Um, you know, uh, we're coming to a you know end of the two years and starting a new two years. I just want to say to everybody, you know, everybody's done such a great job, and this is a volunteer group, and we all put time and effort and subcommittees and and doing everything. So I just want to thank everybody for their time involved, um, especially coming to these meetings in person now, and everything like that. Um, so I, I just have a couple positive suggestions, I guess. So maybe, maybe this next year, this next roundabout, we can get a maybe a park attendant instead of just relying on public works to clean up parks and everything. You know, maybe the the city could just hire a, a park attendant um, to basically go around each park every day make sure the bathrooms are clean, make sure the toilet paper is stocked, make sure the, the toilets are clean, you know, check on the graffiti, you know, make sure the facilities, the, the doors work, you know, Memorial Park, the, the ADA button doesn't work, you know, and um, if there's any maintenance things, and they, that person could report to Public Works for maintenance issues. But I, I hear far too many people saying the bathrooms are filthy, um, and you know, Memorial Park, for instance, there's a playground right there, a lot of kids. And a lot of the public attend that specific playground. There's a lot of, you know, mothers with children, fathers with children, babysitters, nannies. <clears throat> and just to keep things sanitary, I mean, there's a lot of babies and, and young kids using those restrooms. And, you know, maybe they could be a little nicer. Um, they could be kept up a little bit more, a little bit more maintenance can be involved. You know, maybe up in the corner somewhere, there could be a little thing that sprays some sort of scent so it smells good in there. You know, some organic, some lavender or something that's non-GMO, I don't know. But I think we could find a solution on just upkeep on these bathrooms. I know the grass is closed for winter, um, things like that. I know, Harris Park, the grass is kind of a mess, things like that. But we can work on that. I, I, I know the city council just said something about possibly a park such as Terrick Park, Harris Park are going to be up for review for uh, what the turf is. 
and the turf could either be astroturf, which is fake grass, or real grass. So I'm not sure what's going to happen with that. Uh, you know, I think there should be a, a drinking fountain at the top of Albany Hill. The the water pipes are there. I just think that we just need to tap into it. So we should have uh, accessible drinking water at all of our parks, if not a water uh, filling station. Uh, also, I know some, some public has had interest in splitting up the dog park at Memorial Park into a big dog, little dog park. And I think the easiest solution for that is to make the smaller end on the south side for small dog, potentially. Uh, keep the northern end open for a big dog. But that's basically it. I just want to put an emphasis on maintaining the park's bathrooms and, and water at all these parks. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremiah. Is there anyone else, or was that all? No, there are no more public comments. Okay, so then we go on to the next um, item, which is announcements. Does the staff have any announcements? Yes, I do. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so we are thrilled that our activity guide is uh, up and posted on the city website. And here it is here. And it is available to access and uh, browse through. Not only does it uh, contain our programs and events, but as ha happened in the past, it has city news section and also in the back resources for the community. These activity guides will be put into the mail tomorrow and delivered to all the residents. And uh, they will be available, the hard copies, at all the city facilities as well. Registration uh, for these programs in this activity guide, the, the session runs uh, January through April, and registration begins Monday. And programs are popular and fill fast, so uh, hop on online and you can sign up starting on Monday. Okay. I, I have more. I'm oh. going <laughs> to switch my sure share. About that pause there. I'm going to uh, switch my share here. Uh, okay, here it is. It's uh, ball fields. So our ball fields at uh, Ocean View Memorial Park and Jules Terrace Park, as well as the dog park, are now closed for seasonal maintenance. The city's landscaper will be working on overseeding aerating and applying compost, which will allow the fields to heal and refresh for our busy community schedule throughout the remainder of the year. So you could access the status of the uh, winter field and lawn refresh maintenance here on the Public uh, Works webpage and under the tab of construction alerts and updates. And it happens to be the first one on the list and when I click on that arrow, it's giving uh, current updates, which today I actually went out and I saw the ocean view uh, rehabilitation going on. And you could see there they're working on the seeding and the, and the composting. And that does conclude my announcements. Thanks. OK, commissioners. Commissioner Abbott. I uh, do want to put in a word for the Solano Avenue Association's Winter Strollish event. That's this Sunday from 10 to 5 on Solano Avenue. There's going to be a lot of music. A lot of the vendor or a lot of the merchants on the avenue have special events. It's a non, it's a sidewalk event. It's not a closed street event. But it, uh, oh, and, and on the, the Winter Strollish, it's a lot of fun. They have like cookie decorating and things like that for kids. It's going to be a face painter, all kinds of stuff. And then just it's the second weekend of Santon Solano, which is probably my favorite event to, to volunteer with all year. Uh, that's up on, on the Berkeley uh, end of things. But uh, that's uh, from noon to 3, Saturday and Sunday, this weekend and next weekend. Commissioners? Uh, Martin. Um, I actually had questions for staff. Um, we received an email about the state of the <gasps> turf at the dog park and at Memorial Park. And you're reporting on the state of the, the fields and that they're going to be Try to be restored. I, I went out there this last week, and it is 
a lot of it's mud and no grass. And, and, but one of the things the person mentioned was uh, um, what they thought was a faulty irrigation system that was soak, making part of the, the area swampy. And uh, I didn't hear you mention that. Do you know if the landscaping, if the irrigation, I mean, of course, it's also been raining off and on, so I don't really know where the water's coming from. But they seem to think it was coming from the ground. And it, you didn't mention looking at infrastructure problems and, and uh, issues with the irrigation system. Uh, is that also OK, part let, of let's let him respond, because this is really announcements, I, not q and A. I almost like. finished my question. And, uh, and actually, when the public addresses, uh, staff can respond. And so I'm asking staff to respond. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Sure. Uh, Mark Hurley, Public Works Director. So a um, couple things. Yes, the, the uh, turf at the dog park as well as in Memorial Park is at heavy, heavy use and is in really poor shape. And we are looking forward to the turf analysis that was in the uh, master plan that was recently approved that um, will help us guide what to put there that will be more workable for the heavy use. Um, uh, with respect to the 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 water issues at the um, dog park that what I understand is the irrigation system for that area is intertwined with the baseball field so we're not able to isolate that and I think there is a drainage issue too where it rolls back into that I call it the with the southwestern side it gets really muddy um, our hope is when we do the Prop 68 project, and we're going to redo that en entrance, um, and you know, swap the entrance from the, the the street side to there. We can we can make some modifications to the irrig irrigation system to separate those, so we can have better control. So yeah, that's something we know, but it's 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 a larger issue. It's more of the ball fields were. It was viewed as it was put in place to for a ball field and and not the separate uses that we have now. Okay, great, thank you. Sure. Anyone else have announcements? Um, oh, is there more more questions on that? Or can you can you you can, you okay. can go now? Um, I just want to mention this is the last um, this is the last meeting of the 2021-22 20, term. So you'll be seeing uh, some of us will be returning and some of us won't. Um, there'll probably be a lot of changes in the next year with the new city council. So um, so look forward to those changes. Um, and so then on on we go. Um, so we have a um, in, uh, unless there's more. Uh, public works presentation update on creeks and open spaces um, and we have I guess uh, there's some people joining us online I'll take it away Sid. all right good evening commissioners I'm Margot Cunningham Can you hear me yeah you sound great okay I'm gonna share my screen Okay. All right, can everybody see this? Yes. Okay, I'm Margot Cunningham, Natural Areas Coordinator. And tonight, I'll be giving you an overview of natural areas in Albany. So here's our agenda. Give you an update on the eucalyptus, and then I'll go through the different natural areas of Albany Hill, of Albany, I mean, including Albany Hill, and then the creeks. So, update on what's going on with the eucalyptus. I just want to give a recap of what uh, happened with um, previous presentations that we gave. So in October 2021, we gave a presentation, an update to City Council. And there we gave results of the first arborist that we hired to look at the eucalyptus to see what's going on. And they had recommended a handful of immediate removals, which we did in September 2021. And then they recommended removal of 
most other eucalyptus on city lands near roads and trails. So then at the May 2022 meeting uh, of the Parks, Rec, and Open Space Commission, we gave the results of a second arborist that we retained. And they look specifically at trees in the monarch clustering areas. And it was their opinion that um, the risk of whole tree failure for trees inspected in the monarch habitat area was low within five years, but they did concur with the first arborist to remove trees because many are declining and others are more likely to fail as they become more exposed after removing surrounding trees. Okay. So, so I'll discuss, uh, we did a pilot project and then I'll get into the two studies that were recently completed and then funding and grants. So we did a pilot project on Albany Hill this fall involving uh, felling a small number of eucalyptus and reusing material from them. So we worked with Cal Fire National Guard crews and Bay Area Redwood, which is a company that reuses urban trees. So in September, Cal Fire came and they had two crews of 15 people each. So there were about 30 uh, Cal Fire crew members on the hill. They felled 15 dead trees on the crest and near the trail between Taft and Jackson. Some of the crew cut trees and branches and most of the other crew gathered material, brought it to the chipper, chipped it and then spread the chips. And between Taft and Jackson, there's an old trail alignment that we've been trying to block off and people have been continuing to use it um, so they took material branches and logs from trees that they had felled and they blocked the old trail alignment with those. Okay, so then the milling, Bay Area Redwood subcontracted with this portable milling operation and they came in and they gathered logs from three of the larger cut trees and milled them on site, as you can see here. And they, we had them mill two by sixes to use for lumber for retaining walls. And Urban Tilth actually started installing this lumber along Taft today. Um, if you go up there, you can see the work that they started. Other lumber we're gonna use for railings along the Oak Woodland Trail, which will be installed by a Boy Scout working on his Eagle Scout project. And he'll talk to you guys about it next month at the January meeting. So after the milling, uh, what's left are the bottoms of these logs. And we have about 10 of these which they can be used for benches on the hill and also in other city parks. So we hope to use a similar strategy in the future when we have to start filling some trees. And the benefits of, of this kind of project is that you keep the materials on site. So you're lessening greenhouse gas emissions from hauling it away you're getting useful material for repairs and amenities on the hill, and you get the community involved in projects. Okay, so on to the, we have this study that was just completed, an expanded monarch habitat assessment that Stu Weiss of Creekside Science conducted, and he looked at monarch habitat in all of the open spaces on the hill on both public and private land. 
purpose of the study is to see what areas and vegetation structure provide the best conditions for monarchs and how to maintain those conditions. So earlier this year, uh, Creekside Science had a subcontractor fly a drone to get scans of all the trees and shrubs on the hill. And then they also took photos of the canopy from the ground looking straight up to assess light and wind conditions because those are important for monarchs. So there are two core overwintering areas on the hill. One is in a meadow on the west slope. You see here it's called the upper meadow. It's just below the summit and it's sheltered by trees and by the hill itself. And then down below is another overwintering area in this bowl on the southwest side of the hill that's sheltered by a dense growth of trees that you see just west of this crossroad here in this rectangular area. And it's also sheltered by trees further down south, uh, south of this lower meadow. And it's also sheltered by the hill itself. So shelter belts are important for monarchs because they require protection from wind so that they don't get too cold while they're overwintering. When they come to Albany Hill, they're resting before they migrate inland to breed. So they want areas that protect them from the wind. So on the west slope, taller trees provide the primary windbreak but this key shelter belt here in the rec this rectangular area, which is on the 11 acre parcel, it provides ground and middle story wind shelter, which is essential uh, for monarchs using the lower cluster sites you see here in the Southwest Bowl. The Creekside Science also looked at the effects of the fire in June and the canopy dieback of the eucalyptus. So the fire scorched this key shelter belt here. But there are signs of recovery. Trees are sprouting at the base and along trunks. So it, it may recover. Photos of the canopy taken from the ground and then compared to photos that were taken in 2018 showed a similar amount of light coming through and this is because of the extensive sprouting that, that the trees are, you may have noticed they're just sprouting all kinds of branches and leaves everywhere up and down the trunk. And it's called epicormic sprouting and it's because the trees are stressed. So it causes these dormant buds to sprout leaves so that the trees can get photosynthesis so they can get energy. So with this habitat assessment, Stu Weiss got this, uh, made up this map derived from the um, LIDAR data that he took from the drone. And these areas that are outlined in red show dense, low and mid-story vegetation, which provides the wind shelter that is so essential for cluster sites. So this area outlined in blue is, is the key shelter belt area that I showed in the previous slide that was a rectangular area. So this shows all the specific trees and shrubs that are providing shelter for the cluster sites further up the hill. So recommendations that Creekside Science gave are that damaged trees may recover and provide wind shelter. So be conservative about removing them. And he's referring to damaged trees from the fire on the west slope. Standing dead trees and branches don't provide monarch habitat and will eventually fall and damage live trees. So they should be removed when monarchs are not overwintering. Fuel treatments within 100 feet east of the high rises along Pierce would not affect 
monarch habitat, but treatments in the shelter belt west of the crossroad, this area here, on the 11 acre parcel would compromise critical wind shelter for clusters uphill. Replacement trees for blue gums that have to be taken down. He recommended drought resistant eucalyptus species. Gaps in the middle story, which is, you can see this open area here, east of the shelter belt. Gaps in that area can be filled with coast live oak and toy on, and there are actually many already there. So he recommended nurturing those and then planting more. He also said that you can remove piles of fallen dead material throughout the hill to decrease fire hazards and that won't affect monarch habitat. Okay, so the second study that we had done was for to assess fire fuel loads on the hill. And for this, we had wildland fire consultants, Carol Rice and Cheryl Miller conduct an assessment. Fuels are any combustible material, whether man-made or live or dead vegetation. This study looked at vegetative fuels. The consultants came up with fuel models, which are characteristics of vegetation, including amounts, depth, size, and arrangement. Some models are mostly grass, others are mostly shrubs, others are mostly trees, and then some are a mix of those kinds of vegetation. So all the, the colors you see on this map, these are the different kinds of fuel models. The ones that are yellowish are more grass, and then the ones that have more green, those are shrub or tree-based fuel models. So they took the fuel models, combined that with weather conditions and fuel moisture conditions, put that into a computer program to predict fire behavior. And these fuel models closely follow the, the vegetation types that were mapped in the 2012 vegetation management plan. So fire behavior predictions. Fire behavior is the way a fire reacts to the influences of fuel, weather, and topography. And fire behavior outputs that they looked at are flame length, fire line intensity, rate of spread, crown fire activity, and spotting distance. And this map here is an example output showing flame length. So the maps that they came up with, uh, the computer program calculates fire behavior for each pixel on this map. It doesn't calculate fire behavior across the landscape. So they were assuming uh, 20 mile per hour winds. And in this case, wind was coming from the south, southwest at the driest time of year, which is September to November. So for example, if a fire started on the crest of the hill it, on this one pixel here, and the winds were 20 miles an hour coming from the south, southwest, flame lengths from a fire that started there could reach 20 feet. Whereas if you went to the Oak Woodland over here where it's yellow and a fire started at a particular pixel in this area with winds of 20 miles an hour coming from the south, southwest at the driest time of the year, flame lengths would be four feet. And that's a not not a sure thing, but that's a prediction. So recommendations that the consultants came up with 
They reaffirmed the strategies in the 2012 vegetation management plan. And then also said that removing dead and dying eucalyptus everywhere is a good thing. Uh, highest priority, crest of the hill near residences, continue thinning the understory in the oak woodland, create and maintain a hundred foot defensible space from all structures. And then for monarch habitat, consider alternative fuel management strategies. And they emphasize that in order to preserve monarch habitat, all other parts of the hill will need to be kept in a low fire hazard state. Funding, so because the findings from the arborist reports show that eucalyptus are declining, because the fuel load study shows the need to bring down fire hazards on the hill, because climate change is exacerbating pathogens and causing stress from drought, and because the expanded monarch habitat study shows ways to maintain monarch habitat, we need funding for a plan to remove trees and restore habitat. And so in October 2021, uh, City Council authorized appropriation of funds for a capital improvement project. And to date, we have spent 12,194 on the higher level tree safety assessment. And then these are the amounts that we still are projected to spend. And then we also need additional funding. So we, um, City Council in May authorized us to submit a grant to the Coastal Conservancy Wildfire Resilience Program. We applied for the grant and received, um, got an award for the grant for $230,000 and that was awarded in September. The purpose of this grant is to restore natural areas while reducing fire risks, which is what we want to do on Albany Hill. So the three components to the grant, one is to come up, hire a consultant to come up with a plan for removing eucalyptus and restoring monarch and native plant habitat on city property. And we want this plan to be long-term, to consider all plant and animal communities, especially monarchs, include fire safety, erosion control, and bring indigenous knowledge and needs to the table as well. Another component is we wanna keep the hill fire safe in the short term by extending urban tilth contract an additional year. And that's what the 60,000 is there. And we also asked for funding to start a habitat restoration intern program where we want to encourage hiring young people from historically marginalized communities to document plant and animal communities on the hill, which will help in our development of a more fire resilient, healthy ecosystem. Okay, Albany Hill. So now we'll pivot to activities um, on Albany Hill since our last update to, to this commission, which was in May. We have a new webpage for Albany Hill and it has documents related to the Albany Hill project, including studies, funding, staff reports, a lot of the things that I've discussed and we will post the fuel load and expanded monarch habitat studies there. There's also information on maintenance and the pilot project. And I don't know how to do this from here, but this is the web, the web link here, albanyca.org backslash Albany Hill. There's a QR code here also.
So vegetation management on Albany Hill, we're guided by the um, Albany Hill Creekside Master Plan, which has the three main goals of fire prevention, ecosystem health, and access and safety. And in this plan, there is a map that shows the different vegetation units on city property. That's what all these little colored areas are. And um, the consultants who, actually Cheryl Miller, one of the consultants for the fuel load study, she was um, helped come up with the, the 2012 vegetation management plan. So she is quite familiar with Albany Hill. And they discovered that there are this one uh, vegetation unit on the hill called ETHT, which is uh, between the crest and taft, and it has a lot of eucalyptus and uh, this small tree called a toyon, which is an evergreen tree. They think it should be renamed to eucalyptus oak woodland because there's a lot of oaks now coming up in that area. There's a variety of habitats on Albany Hill. It's for such a small area, it has quite uh, a diversity in habitats, plants, and animals. It's situated directly across from the Golden Gate, so it gets cool marine air. And then it's it also gets warmer in, inland influences because it's on the east, east shoreline of the bay. So there's about 130 native plants on the hill. There's over 100 birds that have been documented, over 150 butterflies and moths. Mule deer actually live and breed on the hill. So we have a variety of habitats from meadows with native wildflowers. We've got the oak woodland, which has coast live oak with native plant understory. Cerrito Creek flows just north of the hill and Middle, Cle Middle Creek flows just east of the hill. We've got eucalyptus woodland with a mix of grass in between. And then we have some scrub habitat, which has sagebrush, toy on that, that small tree I mentioned before, uh, and a lot of poison oak. This is an example of the detailed action plan in the Albany Hill master plan that we follow. And it, each vegetation unit has a bunch of tasks of what to do, how often. And so we use this as a guide when we're out there working. Much of the work we do involves removing invasive plants, which are plants that aren't native to this area. Uh, but once introduced, they establish, quickly reproduce, they spread, and they cause harm in different ways to the environment, to the economy, and to human health in some cases. So I talked about urban tilth earlier. They work year-round on Albany Hill and the Creeks. They are a nonprofit based in Richmond. And they teach local residents about the relationships between natural ecosystems, food, health, and justice. And they have a watershed stewardship crew that hires young people to steward and restore ecosystems in and near their communities. So we are in the second year of a three-year contract with them. And here they are on Albany Hill removing some invasive plants. In this case, they're removing Cape Ivy, which is this plant that's draping the, the shrubs on the hill. They do a lot of fire safety mowing from spring to fall. They mow every one to two weeks and they target annual grasses and thistles before their seeds dry out. Other work that they do, uh, this past summer, they repaired parts of the trail and the oak woodland that were eroding. 
you can see here. So they collected downed eucalyptus branches from the crest, tied them together, and then used those bundles to shore up parts of the trail. You also see in the bottom photo that they decommissioned the bike ramps at the bottom of the oak woodland by piling cut branches over the ramps and fastening erosion control cloth over them. And in this other photo, they're taking cuttings. Uh, what, they do, what they did is they pruned the tips of native plants and stuck them in special soil. And then they took them back to their nursery to sprout and hopefully make plants that we can then plant back on the hill and along the creeks. And today they started work on the retaining wall along tap using the, the boards from that milled eucalyptus. Hey, creeks. So these are the main, these are the creeks that we work, work along in Albany. We've got Cerrito Creek on the north, Middle Creek, and then Codernesis Creek on the south. Cerrito Creek, Urban Tilth works mostly between San Pablo Avenue and Adams. There's a section there that's next to the orientation center for the blind, but they also do pruning and weeding further west. So here they are working along the stretch between San Pablo Avenue and Adams. They've been working in this area since 2018. So this past year, they've been weeding, planting, and here they're spreading wood chips which helps suppress weeds, retains moisture in the soil for plantings, and provides nutrients as they break down. Middle Creek. This is showing um, an open channel of Middle Creek, which is immediately south of the orientation center for the blind. So they worked in two areas, actually. Um, in one area, the area just south of the blind center, they had placed tarps the previous year, which are still there to suppress weeds. And here you see them doing some more weeding on the rest of the east bank of Middle Creek. Middle Creek is flowing right here. And then on the photo on the right, they cleared the ditch, which is behind west of the blind center it's a ditch that flows into middle creek and it's the ditch that originates at the far north end of madison and this particular area was cleared in 2018 but then weeds came back so they worked on clearing it again odornesis creek our most intact creek in the albany berkeley area and which has a population of steelhead and rainbow trout. So we work along the section between 8th Street and west to the railroad tracks. So here, Urban Tilth, they prune willows back from the path. And here you'll see on the right that we had our urban forester, John Hawkridge, give us a pruning lesson. So he taught us how to best prune trees, and that's what we're doing here, pruning these willows. And then we also made erosion control bundles from the prunings of the willows, as well as prunings from roses that we took. And we placed these bundles near the creek bank and fastened them down so that when it rains and the creek overflows, They'll catch silt and keep it from flowing into the creek. That we set the idea. <laughs> we'll see how it does with the rains. They also weeded non-native plants, and this winter they'll plant natives. Okay, at this point, I'm gonna send it over to, is it Devorah? Are you gonna this on? 
You bet. Okay. Uh, and I can actually pull up the website if I can um, share my screen for a moment. Okay. Let's see. No. Do I have to stop sharing or how does that work? Uh, yes. Okay. Oops. Where's my button here? I'll uh, throw it back to your slides in just a moment. Okay. I stopped okay. shared. Good evening, Commission. I'm uh, Devorah Zotterer. I am um, program manager here in Public Works. And among other things, I manage our uh, various funding um, that supports our various capital and operating programs. Um, I will share with you that there are two websites that we have um, uh, put up in the last year or so. Um, first one being for Cornelius Creek, we have a shared uh, Creek account that we, uh, here we go. You see Cornelius Creek, Cornelius Creek. Um, we have a shared Creek account and shared maintenance and improvement responsibilities with Berkeley and with um, the University of California. Um, I'll pass it to Mark in just a second to talk a little bit more about that. Um, you can see here that we have a website that we're constantly working to improve uh, that shows a little bit about the history of the creek, um, has links to the documents for the uh, MOU with Berkeley and the UC, um, and has some detail about uh, previous and future projects to improve the creek. Uh, this also includes um, our maintenance um, task distribution and budget, as well as details about the balance of the creek account and expenditures, um, including expenditure detail. The financials on this web page get updated annually pending the completion of our citywide audit. Um, so you can look for that update coming in the next um, month or so when our uh, citywide audit is completed and brought to council. Um, let's see. I will turn it over at this moment um, back to your slides, Margo, and to Mark to talk a little bit more about uh, the creek. Sure thing, is this one on? Yep, good. So what I wanted to do is just give a little context of the uh, MOU. This is a new thing that we have posted on our website, so it's everyone, it's a pretty dense document. Um, the first eight pages or so are the agreement, and then there's a number of attachments. Um, just for clarity, there are a couple of documents in there that um, are not completed, we're trying to dig out and find the, um, the signed versions of them and then we'll post them. There are things like there's a um, access easement uh, um, and, and so forth. So those, those, when we find those documents, we're gonna put them up there so that everyone can see the, the breadth of the document. Um, this document's been in place since 2004, so that's almost two, uh, 20 years now, and it's really been a, um, uh, a structure for us to improve the creek and maintain the creek. And so this is, in, I think there's been three phases so far to improve the creek from uh, the railroad tracks headed east up to uh, 8th Street right now. And then we have on our books a uh, project that we're going to do. This is the bike path that's going to go between uh, 8th and 8th and uh, 10th. This is going to parallel the creek near the ball fields. Um, that's been in the work, and there's some restoration work. And then in the planning phase, there's a uh, uh, community development uh, received a grant to do some planning work for the remainder of the restoration from 8th Street over to San Pablo Avenue. So it's really been a good structure for the development of the creek, as well as, or restoration of the creek, as well as maintenance tasks. And uh, Albany's had an interesting role in this. Uh, by and large, Albany's been the project manager or project proponent for the construction side of things. This is the project development, the design. We've gotten, uh, went out and gotten grants for various elements of this, and we've managed the construction projects. 
Then in the, um, in the MOU, there's very specific uh, roles and responsibilities for the various agencies. One of those um, for Albany is sort of the MOU banker, I call it. So we manage the Creek account, which we have posted um, up, up on the, um, our website. And that was initially funded by some escrow money that, um, I, I don't know exactly the history, but I think it was some sort of land, some sale of property between UC and City of Berkeley, and the funds from that were put into, to help the construction costs, and then the balance of it rolled into the maintenance side. And that's the balance that we have right now, the $344,000 as of um, the end of fiscal 2021, it'll get updated with our current. Um, once this money is expended, each of the agencies have funding responsibilities with the, within the agreement as well. And so you can see that. And it's, it's, it's broken out based on what the task is. Some, t some of these are funded uh, split by Albany and Berkeley, some of them are split by the three agencies. Um, and that's all detailed in the agreement. Um, we also have some very specific maintenance responsibilities. Um, we have, uh, we were responsible for all the monitoring work um, for the grant. So the, the grants came with uh, monitoring requirements. A lot of this was five years past the construction. So we, were, we performed all that work. Um, and then we also do a bulk of the vegetation management. That's uh, what Margot was talking about. And then we also work with Berkeley on the trail maintenance side of things. As you get into the agreement, you'll notice that in some ways it's very narrow. It doesn't address all the issues going on in the creek. You know, and these are particularly the uh, encampment issues, the dumping issues. This is beyond the scope of what was contemplated in, in, this, um, in this agreement. And you know, it's been a struggle for the people who do the day-to-day -day management of the work. In my mind, what has been a really good development here in the last couple months is that um, in this, so some of these issues that aren't addressed in the, in the, uh, in the agreement really fall to the jurisdiction, you know, the, the agency having jurisdiction over the land, and that's primarily UC on the north side and the city of Berkeley on the south side. And in, again, in my, from my perspective, one of the really good developments is that um, UC central campus or governmental affairs folks has really taken a much um, heavier, heavier hand in managing these other issues, and they're looking to schedule this creek, you know, the the State Creek stakeholders meeting in um, February, and uh, they've reached out to Sh Susan Schwartz, and we're getting that lined out, and we're looking at it the first week of February. And the good news with this is that they're able to bring in the full range of resources to address the, the scope of the problems out there. Um, so that's all I had on that piece. Um, this is a table that um, is also posted on our website. This, and I think you've seen versions of this table before, but what this does is list the range of tasks we are planning to do in, in this current year. And it has a couple of things. It has the task, uh, basic scope, who the lead agencies are per the MOU, and then a reference to the MOU section so you can kind of track it through. We have a cost. Some of these we don't, we know it's an issue, but we don't have the, the right solution quite yet, so we are keeping it on the list, and as we develop a cost or a solution, we'll add it to it and go forward and um, uh, complete the work. Um, the couple things that um, are, are on there with the task one is the public space refresh. Those are really getting a significant amount of use now and are gonna need some, some, some TLC. We think we have an idea of what that is, but until we solve some of these other problems, that's, that's gonna be an issue. Um, the two trail maintenance issue uh, tasks, this is one in the paved section between sixth and eighth. It's really, that's a uh, permeable AC 
path that's really unraveling, and we're trying to figure out what the right solution is, and there's, there's a lot of complications with rules that Berkeley has of what you can do in creek areas, so we're working on that, and it's, it's not an acute thing, but it's something we need to deal with in the next couple of years. Uh, the task three, the trail maintenance, this is west of 6th Street. There's an area that's within the floodplain and it floods every year and it washes out. We continually dump rock in there and it washes away. So again, that's not a great solution. So um, again, we're thinking about what, what the right solution would be and then we'll go implement it. Um, the vegetation management, that's something uh, Margo has pretty well lined out and I think that's been a benefit over the next couple, the last couple of years. Um, urban tilth has been great and we want to keep them on um, as long as we can. Um, graffiti's a persistent problem all around. Um, the rain garden refresh, that's something that um, needs to be done. I think at one point we had a, a scout uh, was going to do an eagle project around it. That fell through. Um, I think Urban Tilt does a little bit of it um, now, but that's something that we need to do as well. So. Um, I think that does it, except we have some, the last item, uh, we have some public outreach that we're doing. We're putting up signs, thinking about magnets to, for important numbers if people see spills or issues that we can get out to um, the various agencies. Um, so this is something that um, we have discussed within the three agencies and are sort of tracking our work and, and towards these activities. So with that, I think I'll pass it back to, I think, Devorah. You bet. Great. Uh, thank you, Mark. <clears throat> I'm gonna put um, Margot's slides back up for just a moment. Oops, way too far back. Um, so on to everybody's favorite topic, um, Measure M, our parks open space parcel tax. Just wanted to um, push back up in your minds that we also keep a website on Measure M. This particular page uh, lives under our finance, finance and administrative services department on the website. Um, and I'll take you there as well. Um, just a reminder that we um, have a little bit of history on Measure M uh, on this page that um, uh, we also include a history of tax revenue collected, uh, the various projects and programs that the tax revenue funds, uh, including um, what is budgeted for an upcoming or recently past year and uh, descriptions of our projects and programs that, uh, that benefit from Measure M. Lastly, we also uh, include the annual reports that are issued by our financial, advisor, our financial consultant to, um, about the levy and collection of the tax. This page is also op uh, updated once a year when um, we receive the completed annual audit as we want to report accurately on our uh, financial history. Now, uh, now I will, let me return back to the presentation. I've gotten this question a couple times at previous um, meetings, so I wanted to uh, really call out how we talk and think and work with and plan Measure M uh, internally. In general, our, the Measure M tax revenue is informed by the priorities and projects laid out in the Parks, Recreation, and Open Space Master Plan. Uh, this was passed earlier in 22, in, uh, 2022 in January. Um, and we also incorporate into our strategic planning any new or um, uh, any new maintenance needs or maintenance that needs uh, strategies that need to be revised. So our tactics in, uh, are to support our current maintenance programs 
This includes our parks maintenance program, our street trees maintenance program, as well as the creeks and open space program um, that you've heard so much about tonight. And we keep uh, reserve funds for future capital projects that are coming out of this master plan. It takes time to go from that kind of vision document to projects that are really designed um, and ready for implementation. So we think about our funding needs in advance and we reserve the kind of funds we think we'll need to make these dreams into reality. Um, we uh, also have a backlog of projects that have been desired by previous um, uh, iterations of our, uh, of our city that still need to be implemented. Um, we're working on uh, getting adequate staffing to be able to implement those. And we utilize Measure M um, both for funding projects and for um, matching funds for grants. And then the last thing we do as part of our strategic planning of the tax revenue is we reserve funds for um, needs that arise that are emergencies having to do with our um, with the, the various programs that are appropriate. So for example, um, large scale playground equipment replacement uh, or repair, while smaller repairs are incorporated into our operating budget, a large scale um, uh, project isn't necessarily um, included in those in that our annual operating costs, but it needs to be um, needs to be covered to ensure that our equipment is safe um, for residents to use. So in general, we strive to spend thoughtfully and to um, consider this uh, resource for taking care of all of our needs, both short term and long term. And we want to get the best value out of these revenues for the city. Um, and with that, I think that that concludes our program. I will turn it back over to Margo um, and to you all for questions. Great, thanks, Deborah. Can you stop sharing your screen and I'll share my screen again. I just wanted to show everybody the Albany Hill web page. It's still under construction, but um, we've been working on it. Devorah has been doing a great job. So there's a lot of information about the, the Al Albany Hill Eucalyptus Project. And if you click all these um, project background, project document, all these tabs, if you click them, you get all kinds of other information uh, going more in depth, um, city council updates and uh, updates to the Parks and Rec Commission. So all the um, project documents that we've accumulated over the past couple of years. Um, and then uh, the project funding documents conservancy and the programs that we want to do with with the grant uh, project support all the different agencies and groups that we've been working with and then there's a little bit about the pilot project the tree felling and milling the advisory body presentations and so forth. So, uh, all right. And then let's see where we are on the PowerPoint. Um, Margo, I just wanted to check. Um, is there much longer on this presentation? I'm trying to manage the, the time in the meeting. I'm actually going to questions right now. Okay. So. Here we go. Questions. Okay. So then, um, are there questions from the commissioners? Um, Mario. I, I'll start off with a few. Um, first of all, I'd say thank you so much for the presentation, everyone involved. 
Uh, it's really helpful. Um, I think those web pages are brand new, or at least a lot of the content is brand new, and that's really helpful for the Albany Hill and the Creeks uh, going forward. It has the MOU on there for the Creeks, which is something I've been asking for and other people have been asking for, and I think that's, that's great to get that out there. Um, first, some questions about the Hill. Um, as this is for staff. As someone who lives at the base of the hill, I noticed that tonight's agenda item does not mention Albany Hill or eucalyptus trees at all. It does mention open spaces, but it also didn't mention the bulbs. So there's, there's various open spaces in the city. So I would recommend, I do appreciate that the, that the Public Works has put on the agenda that Measure M is involved tonight, and that's really important because that's one of the few oversight opportunities that the public has to see how the Measure M funds are being spent is to know that Measure M is going to be discussed in a public meeting. And so I appreciate that, that my recommendation to put that on has, has been done. But uh, if the trees are going to be discussed on Albany Hill and our update is being presented, I think that should be, that should be on the agenda. And as someone who lives at the base of the hill and knows people are concerned who live at the, on the hill and saw the fire happen just a few months ago, um, knowing that the that so my so uh, my question is is uh, uh, are, is the uh, so um, can Public Works make sure to say which open spaces will be on the agenda the bulb or each one has a whole set of interest groups the hill and the bulb have totally different interest groups for the most part but very very uh, interested in interest groups. Sure, I think. Um that's a good point, and maybe what we do is put a, um, I wouldn't say a, a full-blown staff report, but some sort of further description of what's going to be discussed so that people have a sense and make, can make a decision to attend or not. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, because this, uh, yeah. Um, thank you. Because I think we have some good information. We want to get it out to folks. You, so that's, you do. Yeah. And, and what we saw from the Hill there in the past had been like a separate agenda item, really. <clears throat> and so, yeah. Right. And, and I think we do contemplate having more formalized updates on just the Albany Hill piece. But uh, again, we wanted to wrap this up. This is sort of our annual mm. open space, sort of the work that Margo has been doing. So. Um, Yes. Do you have any more questions, Commissioner I Martin? Had quite a few, but other people might want to jump in here at some point. Uh, related to the presentation, is I noticed it's not on the agenda, so I wasn't sure what would be discussed. Um, is that something that can be added, added to the uh, agenda in the after this meeting, Isabel? We can absolutely post it. Post it somewhere. Sure. Um, so the this meeting agenda and the slides will be posted on the Albany Hill website, um, as well as our Creeks and Open Space page, which is just one above that in the website nesting. Okay, um, a few quick questions about the Hill. Not long ago, there was a concern that the eucalyptus trees might be diseased. So we were told that wood chips and the trunks couldn't be repurposed. Um, but now in this presentation, we're seeing that at least some trees are uh, what's changed since then? Well, they're being repurposed and reused directly on the hill. So the, the material isn't leaving the site. It's staying on the hill. So. Okay. I think you mentioned some of the trunks might be used in other parks, but did I mishear that? Or is that something you could could happen? Um, yeah. Yeah. The, the, the bottom tree trunks, the slabs could possibly be used in other parks. But um, there's also plenty of locations on, on the hill as well, so. Okay, so it sounds like disease isn't as much of a concern. No, uh, not, not too much. I mean, pretty much uh, all eucalyptus have this pathogen. Um, so you just wanna keep it away from, if, if, there, if you're gonna put it in areas where you wanna keep eu eucalyptus, then you probably don't wanna bring the material there. Okay. But I don't know if there are any parks that, that have eucalyptus, so I think it may not be a concern. All right. Um, for the Monarch study, uh, I heard some Monarchs gathered on Albany Hill recently. Um, I don't know if they're still there. Did they roost where they usually do? Do you know? Yes. And we have a, a biologist who's doing a count this year, so we'll be getting a report from her after the new year. But yeah, they did cluster, cluster right at the summit 
apparently hundreds of them. And I think after the, the rains that came, they have since, I think they may have gone down slope on the west slope where it's more protected. But yeah, I'll be interested to see uh, where they have been clustering. Okay, um, Prop K reform would allow dense development in the private parcel, the big 11 acre parcel on the southwest corner of the park. Uh, it seemed like the shelter belt you were talking about is you know, on that private property, as best I could tell from the maps. It was kind of a little hard to see what was going on. Um, do you know about how many feet that is from Pierce Street? Because um, uh, any development would need to either, would either avoid it or impact that area. And uh, about how many feet is that shelter belt from Pierce Street, would you say? Uh, it's. The number of feet is actually in in the Creekside Science study, and I, I don't remember the exact number, but once we get that study posted, you'll have that information. Um, I think you mentioned in your presentation that there were recommendations from one group uh, in the shelter belt about planting trees or some sort of maintenance. I, I believe that's all on private land, so what's the mechanism for that to happen? That is something we would have to discuss with, with the individual landowners. So it'd be a polite request? I'm not sure. I'm not sure of the mechanism of how that would happen. Okay. Um, and let's see. Uh, you mentioned one of the uh, groups or the con consultants said something like use alternative methods to like um, maintain the areas near monarch habitat. Do you know what alternative methods look like? Because the, the other methods outside of monarch habitat were to remove trees. What, 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 what do you know what they recommend in monarch habitat? They were suggesting uh, keeping the, the middle and low story vegetation where the monarchs cluster and then possibly having uh, clearing the areas around, away from the cluster areas, um, having some kind of horizontal separation between the cluster areas and other parts of the hill to lower the fire hazards. Um, as far um, as... Okay. So there, there could be, basically, uh, they were saying that the rest of the hill, you're gonna have to keep a low fire hazard state, so keep the grasses low everywhere on the hill and uh, remove piles of dead material and ladder fuels. But where the monarchs are, you have to be more cautious to protect the windbreaks, the shelter belts. Okay, that's all my Albany Hill questions. I have creek questions, but I think I'll hold off and see what other questions people have. I think I'd like to have each commissioner give all their questions. And, then, and you're doing a good job of organizing it, so go ahead. If you, if you go to my creek questions, okay. Yeah, just give all your questions. Um, we'll uh, for staff, was Funds of Five Creeks uh, contacted and formed uh, as an interested party in this agenda item? I think I think we did receive an email about it. I'm I, I didn't speak specifically to them, um, but I did think we received an email about the agenda. Okay, sometimes parks um, staff send out emails to people who are known to be interested in just particular items that when they come up. So that would be good to uh, keep that uh, going when creeks are on the agenda. Um, and the, uh, let's see, you, you said that the MOU doesn't have a lot of, um, it has a lot about basic maintenance, but not about dealing with unhoused people and, and things and, and things like that. Um, you mentioned towards the end that there was somebody able to bring in resources to address the full scope of the problems. Um, I, I, I wasn't clear on who that was and what kind of time frame that was on. Sure. So the MOU is 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 there to maintain the 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 improvements that were constructed and it's and it's very detailed in what it includes the the things outside of it um 
sort of our sort of the larger issues. It doesn't get into law enforcement and other things that would get in, involved in in managing property. Um, <clears throat> you see. Uh, their central campus has a governmental affairs group that stepped in and, <clears throat> and is taking on that that task to organize, <clears throat> excuse me, the Creek stakeholders meeting, and they have reached out to Susan Schwartz on that. Um, this is something that we've tried to organize within the um, Creek MOU group, and um, you know we just sort of the the staff level looking at maintaining the vegetation and the trails doesn't have the breadth of resources to solve these larger issues. So the UC, the UC Central Campus folks are bringing in, are, are able to kind of marshal those larger, larger resources and we're scheduling a meeting, um, stakeholders meeting in early February. We're tar targeting the first week of February and it would be held at UC Village, um, their auditorium or their, the gymnasium there. And um, it would be one of the evenings. They're trying to sort out what that date would be, and it would it would be sort of it would be a joint between, you know, we would be involved as well as City of Berkeley would be involved. Okay, and so when you say stakeholders meeting, and, and so Friends of Five Creeks have sent various emails to us and occasionally spoken and explained some of the issues with. Um, the work they're doing is they're doing a lot of work, which is mm -hmm. sounds seems great. But then the the issues with the uh, people who are unhoused, living in the creeks, bringing in debris and, and trash, and then undoing a number of things that they've been doing. So um, it sounds like there, the UC uh, is addressing some of that. My question is, um, the February meeting, you said stakeholders. Is that the three groups that are mentioned on the MOU? So Yes, yeah, so three, all of us, so we're calling it the stakeholders meeting, but it's it's for the public stakeholders coming in, Friends of Five Creeks, other people interested in it to have a discussion about those about those, those issues. Um, but Albany, City of Berkeley, as well as UC, who will be hosting the meeting, will be there. Okay, and they're in, making it so that, will it, will it be a publicly uh, agendized uh, meeting? I, I assume so, yes. I, I We haven't talked those specifics, but I imagine they would be, it would okay. be. And so that sounds like a good improvement. Is yeah. there, uh, how often do the meetings occur? Because we, we found out that the Friends of Pride Creeks was wondering how can they have input? And we found out from city staff that there, that these meetings of the three primary stakeholders on the MOU were happening behind closed doors and were not, uh, not that it's sinister necessarily, but it's just not set up, somehow it wasn't set up to be a public meeting. And so, so a lot of our maintenance meetings are just with the agencies. We have walked the, the uh, creek with Susan Schwartz a number of times. I've mm -hmm. walked it with her, um, various, Margo's walked it with her. So it's, so we do have meetings that are just the three agencies to talk about what needs to be done, what are the issues, and, and so forth. But um, they, they aren't public meetings per se. Um, a lot of our maintenance meetings just aren't. So what do you see as a mechanism for getting more public input from interested groups like Friends of Five Creeks or others? So we're open to walking the creek with them and the table that we have here today was generated by a walk that we took with Friends of Five Creeks. Mm. So um, I think there, there is a lot of coordination. Um, there could be more. But um, you know, I, I I don't know if there's a forum like this that we we hoped would be a forum to talk about things that um, need to be done or need to be addressed. We're 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 not we're not trying to hide anything or um, exclude people. Um, okay. There's I think. On uh, this note, I just I'll let you keep going in a minute. But I just wanted to mention by chance meeting I ran into Susan Schwartz mm -hmm. down by. Cerrito Creek, and we discussed yeah. uh, some of these issues. And uh, the homeless encampment issue, I know, is is complicated yeah. because it's it's not something that necessarily would go to the pros commission. It would also involve other commissions uh, like the SCJC in the city. And but that is uh, a definitely an issue. But I also want to mention 
uh, about the question about where's the public forum. This is the public yeah. forum for people to bring these issues. Sure. And Susan mentioned, and I mentioned that this would be on the agenda this month, and um, she said she just couldn't make it this month. And so that's sure. that's one of the things. Sure. Um, but I do think, you know, and, and this is going to get into the subcommittee topic, which is yeah. next. We'll talk about this, so I won't say much about it, but... Sure. Yeah, that's that's one of the things we're going to be looking for. So, a, and I'll let you two continue yeah, that. I think there's a fair fair amount of collaboration or coordination with uh, Susan's group. Uh, an example of that was last week. She emailed us about a, an encampment in Cerrito Creek area, and we got on it with our process. We we uh, Sid's group went out and and made contact, offered services. Um, we. We, we, on public work side, we uh, posted the site with PD. We um, were able to get them into services. They, apparently, they, they accepted services and were able to clean up the site and took out a tremendous amount of um, uh, trash out of Middle Creek area out behind the orientation center. It was almost two large um, uh, box trucks of, of, of material. So I, th I think we could always do better. There is a fair amount of um, uh, direct contact with uh, agency groups. Okay, that's good to hear. Um, we've also had a walk with uh, some of us a few years ago with uh, mm -hmm. Susan Schwartz and Friends of Five Creeks. Um, so that's good to hear that engagement. Do a question is um, the February meeting uh, is that a one-off or is that considered going to be a quarterly or an annual? I, thing? I don't. I don't know. I mean, I think it's. That could be discussed. It's, it's nice that we're doing this, and maybe a, a structure comes out of that to deal with these these other issues. Um, and then I, okay, I think that's it for me. Thank you. Sure. And you know, I just wanted to mention on the encampment topic, because I went and took a look. Um, I was down by, um, by the senior center. So this would be 8th Street going through, going over the creek there. And I saw an encampment that was spanning the creek. That it was literally, there was a, a tent covering the creek. Um, and so that's, you know, I would applaud uh, the Friends of Five Creek for raising these issues. Um, but it's obviously not an easy thing to deal with. Um, one of the things she mentioned on our, our chance encounter was the jurisdiction's more complicated along these creeks than you would think it is. I thought it was one side of this, the, the creek was owned by one city and the other side, and she said, no, there's sections where the whole creek is owned by Albany. And the whole, so, yeah, you go ahead. No. Yeah, the, the, the jurisdictions are complicated. And, um, you know, when, when it is in a very clearly Albany area. We have a very clear process in how to deal with it. Um, when there are areas such as um, UC, it's it it does get a little more complicated, and 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 we don't have the same authorities there, and um, so we need to rely on um, UC or City of Berkeley to uh, respond. Do other commissioners have questions? Uh, Commissioner Amendries. Just a quick one, um, just to follow up on the responsibility of Albany. And you mentioned that vegetation management was mm -hmm. for Albany. Um, what about like, uh, fences and seating and stuff like that that's not the trail? Um, if I recall, that is split between Albany and Berkeley. So that's one of the things. And in the the refresh area in in that I think it was task one where we talked about the refresh that that includes some of the benches um, since we're taking more of the the vegetation management piece of it Berkeley said they would would do that piece of it but again depending on what it is we talk about who's best able to do the work um, and one one of the things that we don't have a very large staff we have seven maintenance workers for everything the city has. That's roads, sewers, parks, trees, everything, buildings. So we don't, we can um, engage someone like um, Urban Tilth and scope that out and manage that. That's, that's our sweet spot in doing things. If it's, hey, I need somebody to go 
fix it. Berkeley has more resources to put at, at those types of tasks. Other commissioners? Questions? Um, thanks, Brian. Actually, you took the wind out of a lot of my questions. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you do, have, you do a few. Um, and I was curious about the monarch uh, status, but it sounds like the report's coming, and I'll learn more about that, so I'll hold off on questions for that. Um, the invasive removals, it's always such an issue because you, right, you remove it, and then it comes back, and you can remove it. It's just like, well, what's the sense? And so I thought that, and maybe it's in the report, I'll get to that in a second, but that with the invasive removal comes planting of something that will push out the invasive or shade it out. Is that part of the process or are we just removing? And, and it's, it's, a, it's actually two things. It's at least on Albany Hill, removing the invasives, there are plenty of other natives that can then have room and space and light and uh, water resources to then grow and take over. But we also supplement that with native plantings. So uh, along creeks, it's it's more of a, since there isn't necessarily natives there to begin with, it's taking out the invasives and coming back constantly to, to uh, root them out and then plant natives. And eventually the natives take over, hopefully. In the long run. Okay, great. Yeah. yeah. And then with with the camp, um, I know you explained how Measure M doesn't have the money really for the removing the camp, or that's part of its uh, authority. Where does the money come from to remove the camps? So for the, um, this is the encampment cleanups and so forth. Yeah, that's right. We've been, we essentially bill it to Public Works as operating budget. We have a code um, that we track it, um, so we don't have a specific amount. But um, you know, if our budget gets pinched, we'll ask for more. Okay. And um, the last thing, there's there's a lot of information today, and it was really interesting. It would have been useful to see the report, so we could look at it a little bit beforehand. It was kind of overwhelming to try to take it all in. Well, that's one of mine. I had the same yeah. the same feedback that today. I mean, also, there was yeah. a lot. So it may have been better if this had been two presentations. Um, but yeah, it, we, we, it's always good to have something on the agenda ahead of time if you can pull it off. Like, yeah. so, so yeah, I I apologize for that. The studies were actually they're still being finalized, so I, I couldn't get them out in time for the uh, for this meeting. But um, once, uh, once they are actually final, we'll put, post them on the Albany Hill website along with this presentation. And then I actually plan to give another presentation to city council, to the new city council about the eucalyptus. So you'll get to hear that again and actually in more detail. Yeah, we'll look forward to that. Uh, more? Um, anyone else want to join the party? Okay. Um, I guess, yeah, there's some, my question, yeah, would be maybe if we could delve into this, um, and we'll go to public comment after this, but if we could just delve into this um, encampment issue a little bit, because we've heard a lot of feedback uh, on the commission, we've gotten emails, we've seen it, and it's, what what is the pro appropriate avenue to discuss this? I mean, is it the pros commission? Is it? You know, because it seems to me it's like, well, it, it encompasses both, you know, the the use of the parks, but it's also a social justice issue. Are we going to go, you know, ev evicting people that are homeless? And where what's the best forum? I mean, I'm just like opening it up to, to anybody from the staff. What can we do about this? I mean. Well, I think, um, you know, all of the city commissions uh, work on their work plan when they start, um, you know, as new commission, a new commission. So whichever commission has that on their work plan uh, would be able to talk about homelessness. And I think at this time, it's probably the Social and Economic Justice Commission. But most of the, um, you know, most of the aspects of dealing with encampments it, it is managed at the staff level. You know, we do have ordinances that uh, dictate how we um, 
uh, how we address uh, homelessness in Albany. So uh, that would be my response to your question at this time. I guess because it, it, it seems to me like maybe there should be some sort of joint meeting to discuss the topic because you know we're getting hit with it here, you know, or we could say, um, well, okay, but I think that's good. So right now it's that issue is in the FCJC's work plan, mm -hmm. and if Pros Commission wanted it to be part of our, then we would have to propose a work plan amendment if we wanted to have some sort of overlapping role. Right, and, and at this point, as I mentioned, there's not a clear role for any advisory body in um, you know, addressing homelessness. The city council has put a lot of resources into addressing homelessness. We have a contract with Berkeley Food and Housing Project, uh, which does outreach, engage, engagement, and um, uh, housing navigation. Uh, for people who are experiencing homelessness in Albany, so we, um, you know, we have we uh, they just approved a two-year contract um, for over, you know, a million dollars, and so there's a lot of resources already de dedicated by the city council on this issue. Okay, um, and, and just uh, let's uh, I guess let's go to public comment then. Um, who we have? Um, how yeah, many we yes, got? we do. Do we got three? So far we have three, yes. Okay. Yes, let them in with the standard amount. Go ahead, Jackie. Hi, um, my name's Jackie Hermes Fletcher, and I wanted to um, talk to you about the Village Creek off Jackson, north of Cordonesis and flowing alongside Ocean View Park, Ocean View Community Organic Garden, and the Village. Um, this is a very unhealthy creek with all kinds of branches and bushes and limbs laying in the middle of the creek. Seems like it could be a fire hazard. And I'm wondering if uh, Marco's team or the city could help that creek uh, become healthy. It could be a great teaching creek for children at the school right next door if that creek was cleaned up. It's um, concerning to a lot of public people I've talked to around Albany. Thank you very much. Next speaker. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. So it's been a little like watching your own funeral. I unexpectedly am here, Susan Schwartz, head of Friends of Five Creeks. Uh, my uh, other responsibilities uh, let, let me off uh, this evening. I cannot comment intelligently on a report that I've never seen before. So I don't really have anything to say except to agree with those uh, who have said that it would be good I understand there are all kinds of problems, uh, but in the case of both of the reports being considered tonight, to be able to read them in advance, because you can't, you can't think about such, something, at least I can, on this kind of notice. So really the only things I want to say are, um, I applaud the city for these uh, improved uh, information on websites. Um, there is definite progress. Uh, in many details, you see finally put in a gate uh, between San Pablo and Tent. So if there's a flood, somebody can do maintenance. Uh, Albany is doing many things. Um, however, the idea of revising the MOU to make it work up to San Pablo or to make it work for the real range of, um, of problems appears to have been dropped. My it appears to me that Albany now has uh, declined to take any responsibility for camps on the Albany or north side of the creek, that it thinks that UC has the resources, UC may have the resources, but UC has expressly told its staff not to do deal with these camps. So there is no one. Actually, Berkeley, I hate to praise Berkeley on the grounds of homelessness, uh, you can eventually get them to do something but you can't get anything done at all on the north side of the creek. Um, so uh, don't kid yourselves about this, what's, what's going on. And yes, it, it will need to be addressed. 
similarly with notification about uh, camps on Cerrito Creek, which used to be used worse than, than Potonistas. Um, it actually was my third try to inform uh, Albany about the Cerrito Creek camp, finally uh, got through, and that's just a matter of clarifying the procedure. But a little, a little bit needs to be uh, worked on there. So I look forward to digesting this report, and um, I'm not, this is not by way of complaint, uh, but I might have more to say at another time. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Susan. Can we have the next speaker? Uh, there are no more speakers at this time. Okay, well, I guess. There, um, uh, another, uh, sorry, Commissioner, uh, oh, Chair, a, a hand just went up. We'll forgive him, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, everybody. Uh, this is Jeremiah. Uh, I'm, I'm going to respond to this accordingly. You know, a couple of solutions I have uh, are we, we as a community, we need uh, creek cleanup days once a month. So City of Albany could host a uh, creek uh, cleanup day once a month. That way, at least once a month, we're checking in on the creeks. That way homeless, I'm sorry, unhoused encampments don't get too big and too messy. Because the issue with the unhoused camping out in the creeks is a lot of the trash ends up in the creeks and it flows down the waterway. It clogs up the drains. It becomes a mess that needs to be cleaned up, which can be very expensive. It can add to the public works overtime budget. Eventually, if public works can't handle it, the city's got to go to a third party vendor to do creek cleanup. And then what? The city council's going to have to approve a half a million dollars for a hauling company to do all that. You know, there's a lot of needles. There's a lot of danger, a lot of risk uh, involved with cleanup. Do we really want to expose our public works maintenance crew to all that? So a third party cleanup crew may end up happening in the future, which is gonna cost a lot of money. So a, a solution could be possibly putting up some fences. If, if there aren't enough, enough, we need to put up some more fences. We need to put up signs saying, no, you know, camping in the creek. Because people are gonna keep camping in the creek if there's no sign telling them not to. So are there signs saying no camping in the creek? Because if there's not, it's just going to be a free for all. So we need to put up some signs saying no camping in the creek. Uh, you know, littering, fined $1,000 for littering in the creek. We need to conserve our waterways. We need to protect our waterways. So basically, I see a couple of solutions are regularly, regular, creek cleanups once a month per creek and that gives the community a way to get involved so we need regular creek cleanups uh, that way we can keep an eye on our creeks that way these unhousing cabinets don't get out of control um, that way we can get to solutions right away so after the monthly cleanups we need to organize uh, some money to put up some fences so that way we can get it off of signs saying no camping in the streets. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremiah. Do we have anyone else? No, there's not. Okay. Um, does the staff want to respond to any of the questions or comments? Or I don't think I, we have any additional. Okay. Um, any further discussion from commissioners or do we want to go on to the next item? I uh, just want to check in if Margot had anything to say to the one speaker who asked about the creek through UC Village. Sure. Yeah, that's uh, that creek is part of UC property, so they take care of it. And actually, she, the speaker was talking about a lot of debris and 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 material. I'm not sure if that's a bad thing because that actually provides habitat. So I'm not sure if 
if all of that uh, debris she's talking about is, is necessarily bad. And you have to be careful. Uh, there are regulations and laws about what kinds of activities you can do in terms of vegetation management along creeks. And you can't just clear everything away from the creeks because that destroys habitat. Do you, can you recommend someone they can talk to at UC or a group, a department they could reach out to to ask about that creek? Yeah, there's a, a maintenance department um, actually in the village. So she could go talk to them. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other commissioners? I just, just a, a quick comment. Uh, number one, thank you so much. This is a, a ton of information, very valuable. And, and uh, I don't want anybody to take this as a negative at all, but I kind of wish this was in February when we're going to have a lot of new faces here. <laughs> this is a great base. And so there's going to be people that would have been really valuable to see this. So I think we need to recommend that they watch this because that was such a great presentation. But anyway, thank you so much. A fabulous lot of information, very valuable. I'm sure she'll be back with more in February by the time that rolls around. But other um, commissioner comments or? Uh, okay. Uh, um, yeah, I had one for uh, Mark, if he could respond to uh, Susan's question about uh, why the city of Albany, or why no one apparently seems to be dealing with encampments that are on the north side of the creek. Well, I think uh, UC Berkeley does. I think it takes them, um, takes more inertia to get get moving. Um, so, but but I think ultimately they do um, respond when the pressure gets builds up to a certain point. Okay, uh, she was saying they don't. So, what? Uh, how would you recommend people apply pressure? I think this um, the stakeholders meeting that they're looking to post in um, February is the forum to do that. And I would note this is the first time the public has been invited to these three groups that come together. So yep. I, I'm glad you're, you see that having outside groups come in and speak being the, uh, helpful yep. to the overall process. Sure. Okay, I think we're ready to move on to the next item. Um, and there is, there is no uh, action item. So thank you so much to um, everyone from the maintenance department. Yes, thank you. And then we're gonna move on to the um, item 6-1, the community engagement subcommittee update. And thank you so much for the great uh, subcommittee report. Um, so I guess, uh, who, how, how do you wanna work this? Where's, who wants to give it for it? Excuse me. Um, I'm wondering if we can pull up, is it possible to share the report on the screen? Maybe? That might make most sense. We have the technology. <laughs> uh, so Commissioner Amendries and I are really looking forward to talking to you all about this, so thanks for taking the time with us. start well yeah <laughs> all right <About> the presentation. <laughs> um, so uh, we'll start with an introduction to the sub subcommittee's goals <clears throat> our process and then share some major themes and takeaways um, and some recommendations that we've assembled um, so the from our um, from this Commission's work plan uh, the goal of the Subcommittee on Community Groups is to research and develop processes for the city to engage the community groups that provide care, programming, and upkeep of the Albany Parks and open spaces. 
The committee and its mission originate from the 2021 Albany Parks Recreation Open Space Master Plan in which it was recommended to develop a process to organize community experts groups to assist with the maintenance and management with parks and open spaces. Um, this commission received approval from Albany City Council to amend our 2021-23 work plan with this task uh, in May of 2022, and then the subcommittee was formed and approved by this commission in, on June 9th, 2022. So then Commissioner Amendores and I um, embarked on a process of talking to city staff and community organizations about how they already collaborate to care for Albany parks and open spaces and how um, these collaboration efforts might be improved or expanded. Uh, we did research on programs and strategies of other nearby and similarly sized cities. And just uh, broadly speaking, this experience has just been another reminder that there are a lot of folks uh, working both within the city and in, within the community um, who are very dedicated to caring and advocating for Albany's parks and open spaces. And they all carry deep knowledge and experience of those spaces expanding, enhancing, and streamlining collaboration between community organizations, city staff, and city commissions is a significant opportunity to leverage knowledge, energy, resources, to care for our public realm in even more meaningful ways. <clears throat> so the groups we talked to were the Friends of Five Creeks, Susan Schwartz uh, spoke with us, Carol and Diana with the Friends of Albany Hill, Susan Moffat with Love the Bulb, uh, Lois, Jackie, and Judith with the Ocean View Community Garden, Margot Cunningham with the with City of Albany, and Isabel and Sid. Um, and uh, our, uh, Commissioner Mendries is going to start us off with some of the major takeaways and themes. Yeah, um, I guess maybe I'll just first uh, say thank you to all of the people who met with us. They spent um, maybe more than an hour with us, and we went into the spaces um, to, to meet with, with folks. Um, so, so thank you to them. Um, so first, we're going to give the, our major takeaways, and then we'll, um, we sort of split those up into four different sections, and then um, give our recommendations. So um, I was just going to read this. But uh, our first uh, falls under uh, what we call communication and coordination. Um, community organization members and city staff hold a wealth of historical and operational knowledge about the spaces they steward. Some, some of the groups have members who have been stewarding the space for many, many years, so, so definitely have um, a lot of experience and knowledge. Um, uh, we found that uh, greater cross-communication and coordination between community um, organizations, city staff, multiple commissions could provide great opportunity to share learnings, increase capacity for projects, and organize around um, priorities. Uh, so just a, you know, increased uh, coordination between all, all of the uh, participating stewards. And then um, the second uh, major takeaway falls under public outreach support. So community organizations are looking for tools to connect directly with potential volunteers within the local community to continue to develop the long-term stewardship of parks and open spaces. There are um, tend to be t a lot of the same um, group of leaders of the stewards, but there's lots of volunteers who kind of come um, and go, and, and uh, they're always looking for, for ways to sort of build their participation. Um, and then there's material support. You know, organizations generally have the basic tools that they need to perform their usual um, maintenance tasks and projects. Um, uh, but there are certain requirements or projects that affect the public realm and require greater logistical, material, and financial um, support than the, than the organization, individual organizations might have. Um, and these might include, you know, more complicated repairs to equipment or um, uh, resources on site um, or like hauling away waste um, or specialized tools and vehicles. Um, <clears throat> and then finally on the major takeaways is the Friends of Albany Parks. Um, and everyone we talked to talked about the Friends of Albany Parks. Um, and what a valuable program it, it was. And this, for those who don't know, this is a program that um, uh, existed until the pandemic and um, was a uh, was organized by the city. They would kind of coordinate and organize volunteers to come into um, 
the parks to help do cleanup and maintenance and kind of general stewardship activities. Um, and they would rotate through different spaces. And if there was a stewardship organization working within the space, the city would often work in collaboration with that organization to um, organize an event and um, bring uh, volunteers and provide the kind of the, the logistical support that was necessary for the activities. Um, and uh, these, that program just seems like it was a great um, uh, opportunity to build stewardship capacity uh, within the community and provide opportunities for, for more collaboration between the city and the organizations. You want to start recommendations? Yeah, so uh, under recommendations for um, falling under the heading of communication and coordination, we have clarify and communicate who the city points of co contact is or are for a community organizations, uh, programming, logistics, repair, support, et cetera. So some people had someone that they knew or um, or some people just didn't, didn't know. Sometimes they would like contact somebody who was part of public works. Maybe they see them on the street. <laughs> they know to go there. Um, it just seemed to vary a lot, and it was not really clear. It was not clear um, always to who, who is. Um, so we would just recommend clarifying um, and communicating who the, the point of contact uh, should be for these groups. Um, second, we recommend that we um, hold regular check-in meetings quarterly or biannually with uh, community organizations, with staff from public works um, and the rec department um, included. And third, uh, we recommend holding an annual meeting with city staff, commissioners, and all community groups st stewarding parks and open spaces. Um, it's a, a, an opportunity for just uh, capacity building and information sharing among the groups. Um, so I think uh, at least an annual meeting would, I think, help with, with that. Um, fourth, uh, consult with community organizations when making decisions about maintenance and changes to the spaces they care for. Um, we know that this is sometimes um, done, um, but maybe, maybe not always, or at least the group is, does, doesn't, groups don't always feel um, this way. And then fifth, invite community organizations to attend relevant uh, commission meetings and provide updates about their work at commission meetings. Second um, group of recommendations fall under our public outreach support. So we recommend that you include contact information and description of community groups on the city website. Um, the city website, we spent a little bit of time trying to find like where maybe it, it could fall, and we thought maybe under maybe the recreation department. Um, there's also this section that's called I want to, um, and it has a bunch of a list of things. Um, we noticed, noticed missing from that was a volunteer section, like our how to get involved section. <laughs> um, we thought something there could be, uh, could include the link to the links of all of these, of these groups. Um, we also recommend including announcements about community group events in the city e-newsletter. E um, we heard from city staff that it was, uh, the focus is, is primarily city um, events and city-led uh, programs, um, but we think that there could be space for just sort of like a regular community corner or something to, to highlight um, community events. And again, I know this is sometimes already done, um, but just kind of expanding um, opportunities for that. And then third, um, we recommend including contact information about the community groups in the seasonal uh, rec guide. Um, recommendations for material support. Um, many of these kind of build on what uh, Commissioner Menderes was saying about just clarifying who points of contact are. Um, sometimes people don't know where who to ask for help, and um, that includes material support. Um, but through those points of contact, the city might be able to provide access or recommendations for share information on relevant grants that could be used, that could be applied for through organizations or other funding opportunities for organizations working in the parks. The f information could really flow in two directions. You know, organizations might also be coming upon their own funding sources that they might recommend the city access. Um, we heard that there may be, at some point, was a tool lending program, but we're not really sure about that. Um, and uh, 
And if, but if so, um, uh, I think that would be a really valuable program to bring back for, at least for kind of organizations to access, if not individuals. Um, and then um, just generally providing stewardship activity uh, logistical support, and again, this is being done already in some cases, um, and often it's just a matter of people knowing who to con reach out to to ask for help, um, but help with what, things like waste pickup, hauling water, parking logistics advice, you know, um, vehicles, things like that. Um, and uh, yeah, just clarifying um, who people should be contacting for that information. And any kind of options for like streamlining that process, and maybe that's just the contact information. And final uh, big recommendation is um, reigniting the Friends of Albany Parks. Um, and uh, I think you know, Isabel and said and Sid said they both are really want this to happen. Um, and as in the past, uh, events could be in collaboration with community groups where they're present. Um, and just with the city where they're not, and um, the programming can build additional long-term stewardship capacity and programming in the parks where no formalized community-based stewardship currently exists. You know, maybe the people who get involved through Friends of Albany Parks eventually get together and form their own organization for Terrace Park, let's say, and it becomes formalized. Um, and it can also bring more volunteers to the existing community organizations um, after those events are held. And then lastly, um, just some long-term opportunities we, we were thinking about. Um, we thought that the, the, this commission um, subcommittee um, might want to continue beyond <laughs> these recommendations um, for one, uh, just to sort of like monitor the progress on uh, this, these recommendations. Um, but also we, um, we, we included some uh, links at the end um, about other cities, uh, but we didn't actually get an opportunity to meet with other other city groups. Um, I think there was one gardening group we also didn't uh, get a chance to meet. So they feel like there could be still more um, more work uh, around this this topic. Um, secondly, uh, as Julia mentioned, the Friends of All the New Park. Um, really have an opportunity to, for establishing new stewardish, stewardship groups, um, such as at Terrace Park, Memorial Park, um, et cetera. So we're just we're really excited about um, the, you know, post-COVID return <laughs> of, of this. Um, and lastly, we just wanted to mention that we heard from um, a few people about uh, an adopt-a-spot uh, programming opportunities. Um, so this could be even like, does, maybe it doesn't have to be a whole park, but it could be a, a strip um, of, of space in, in Albany, um, but maybe something to, to just investigate. Um, so does that, that conclude the report? That concludes or? the report and our okay. recommendations, so, so thank I think you. What, what we'll want to do with this one is we'll do commissioner questions, then public comment, then commissioner comments, and we may have a decision <coughs> out of this. So. Um, if that makes sense to people, could we have uh, commissioner questions? So. Um, is there an issue with insurance? How do they handle that? If you have all, friends of Albany Parks, for instance, and they have a work um, party, and somebody puts a shovel through their foot or something, I mean, how does that work? Is the city, can anyone make a friends of group and start working in city property? Or is there a formal process where they get sanctified by the city? Um, that's a good question. Um, I can answer that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, Friends of Albany Parks was um, a program that uh, was put together by the Recreation Department and um, was very successful until the pandemic hit. So um, we plan on reinstating the Friends of Albany Parks uh, in the next year or so uh, as we're ramping up our programming and um, we're f we finally are almost fully staffed and we'll be able to um, you know, reinstate Friends of Albany Parks. And a lot of the recommendations that I see on uh, this list, I think, will naturally flow into uh, you know, the, the, the reinstatement of, of this program. So thank you. Was, I didn't but, get the, I, was right, the but your question about the insurance. Well, we don't need, it's a city fund, it's a city sponsored oh, so it's like program. A, it's, like, it's kind of a quasi official 
It's a city-sponsored program, so individuals don't need insurance. Right. Yeah. I think maybe there was another side of your question, though. If if there were someone were doing something not part of the program, then I think that wouldn't be. Well, I mean, the volunteers well. need to sign in. You know that yeah. there's a volunteer Labor. form and there's a release of liability. And uh, but as far as insurance, um, this the city sponsors the events, so. Individuals don't yeah, need to have their own insurance. Signing the waiver at these things. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you. Is that it? Or um, just want to throw in the, the tool ending. Um, when you mentioned it, it sounded like you're talking about real tools. I was thinking like gloves and trash bags. Yes, that program was also uh, in effect before the pandemic. Okay. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. so could I, I understand then that if someone had wanted to go out and do this work during the pandemic, they wouldn't have had access the normal supply of stuff. But it wasn't, the the the, um, the tool library was mostly for individual families who wanted to do work on their property, like somebody who needed a rake or needed a, a saw to do a special project on their property would come to uh, the recreation department and borrow a tool for um, a week or two as long as, or as long as they needed it. Um, for the work parties, most of the time, um, the city would provide uh, the, the, the tools for the work pot party to occur. Yeah. Work. No, my last comment was, when you said the annual meeting, it seemed like they should have an annual party, too, or something, or a meeting slash. <laughs> um, this, this is questions still, so. Oh, sorry. We'll, we'll get into decisions. Um, so go ahead. Uh, just to follow up to the tool lending library, is that something that you expect will start again? It's on our to-do list. It's probably a little further down than the Friends of Albany Parks, uh, but um, it is on our list of, of things that we may uh, bring back in the future. Yeah. Anyone else? Um, go ahead. I just, first of all, thank you both for doing that. It's great to really engage those community groups because since I've been on this commission, we, ha you know, there hasn't been direct. I, I don't remember being really being really direct and um, reaching out besides the staff. I mean, but as com commissioners, so that's great. I had a, just a quick question. What is an adopt a spot? Can you explain that? Or yeah. Um, I, there's kind of it happens at different scales. I think. Um, El Cerrito has a program, and uh, Oakland has a program, we know. San Francisco does. Um, and they, uh, s I think San Francisco is, is adopt a street. But you can, someone can sort of like uh, designate, choose a place. Maybe it's just like the planting strip somewhere, or maybe it's an actual park. And they'll ask the city, like, hey, can I kind of be the designated steward for this space? Um, and and then there's kind of a direct like line of communication between the city, whoever manages that program, and that person, that steward. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, and now I had a question for the staff um, that pertains to this subcommittee. So because this is the end of our term, can the subcommittee continue in that gap between meetings, or does it have to stop its work and then? Right. At this point, um, you know, this is your probably the last meeting as yeah. the, as uh, this full commission. Um, and uh, in the near future, this you'll receive an email from the city clerk letting you know when the application process for the new term will uh, be open. So if you're interested in continuing uh, on the commission, you can uh, reapply. And, um, and, and you, are, um, you will be asked to serve until up to 45 days after, um, I think it's the certification of the election, or until replaced oh. or reappointed. So there's a possibility that we'll be meeting again in January. Yes, yes. Oh, I see. Some because of you of may, some of you may election. not. It just depends on how. But we'll, you'll receive more information, the, more the, detailed information. For the practical purposes, we can't continue any subcommittee. We can't, subcommittees can't meet between now and January, I guess. That's oh, no, you could. They could. You, yeah, so you they could. they could continue. It just depends the, on the timing the of the reappointment process. Okay. So right, you may, they may not that. be able to provide a, a report at the January meeting okay. if both members are not reappointed or they're replaced, right? So, but we have this list as staff and we really appreciate it also. And we will, 
as staff, it is our, our responsibility uh -huh. to uh, take this in and, and, and move, the, move those uh, recommendations along. So and, we're. And if I can just jump in quickly about subcommittees, uh, that uh, they're not supposed to be ongoing things. They're supposed to have a start and a stop. Uh, Brown Act things, because you're getting around any, mm. any uh, uh, quorum and, and noticing requirements. So they aren't supposed to be ongoing. So just as part of that answer. Yeah, but in the, I guess in this case, we haven't reached the ending point. Oh, no, I just meant, I mean, I mean, I mean in, in, in their re report, they say continue it uh, and look at it. Yeah, I was just wondering about the technicalities sure, of the sure. law on this issue, so but for what's going to come. Uh, okay, it, more questions. Uh, yeah, I had some questions for the subcommittee. Um, in the communication and coordination part, you mentioned um, hold regular check-in meetings quarterly or biannually and hold annual meeting with city staff, commissioners, and so and community groups. Um, do any of those, uh, do you see those most as sitting down with uh, city staff in city hall or public works office, or do you see it as more of a, a public meeting, for example, the, the dog park subcommittee had, uh, we did a, a public workshop and we had community members come and brainstorm on butcher paper and you know, the whole, the whole thing. So do you see, that was an agendized kind of thing. So do you see those as being just meeting directly with staff, just one-on-one, -on -one, or do you see it as like uh, e either of those uh, items as being uh, open to a, a more of a public meeting? Um, I think so there's two two things right so one is like just with the group and the city um, staff and I think that those things could kind of be determined by the group like maybe it's out at their space and and but it's like multiple like both rec department and um, public works being kind of a, a group to that can hear all of the same things about what this group is doing and and what resources they provide and just like but I think the other one um, with all groups and all staff and, and commissioners, maybe could be a bigger like at City Hall, um, but I'm not I'm not totally sure. I, I actually I'll chime in here because I had a question about this one too. Um, so did you when you say this is item three a three hold an annual meeting with city staff commissioners and all community groups. Did you mean one meeting with everyone or is it one meeting per group? So there's <laughs> two. I'm talking about 3A-3 specifically oh, on 3A. this. Oh, that's all groups. All groups, yeah, one, all stewardship one. groups. I think so by the, bra the including the At commission the though. Is yeah. this including the, so okay, because yeah. by law that would have to be a public meeting. With the, yeah, so. Yeah. And I could see this happening at one of the commission meetings. Yeah. You know, it could be one meeting dedicated once a year to where we invite all of the uh, groups to come to the commission meeting, and it's an agenda item, and, um, you know, to talk about a specific uh, item that the commission would uh, identify ahead of time. So that I could see that happening. Sounds great. Back to you, Brian. That's it. Sounds great. That's right here. Um, other commissioners? Uh -oh. I just right. want to correct something because I said that we never met with community groups before and we have. <laughs> so, so I don't want to dismiss the work. Well, some of the, I said that I've been on the commission for a long time. We've never met with these community groups. But that's, that's not true because I, I now I'm remembering that there was a whole community garden effort and I know that at various times I met with the love the bulb. So I just didn't want to dismiss the work of other commissioners and myself. And talk. But I think it's really interesting to look at it this way. Like look at it like how generally um, sort of as a city process are we meeting with these groups and how can it be improved? Um, yeah, anyway, so I'll save the rest of my comments for later. Yeah, let's, let's have questions now, but thank you. Yeah, we will forgive you. <laughs> I don't think it's a big deal. Um, any other commissioners? Okay, uh, do we have any public comment? Yes, we have one so far. Okay, uh, let him in, Sid. Yeah, thank you, subcommittee, for this wonderful uh, report. You did a lot of research. You're, you're a little bit weak, the, the volume. Can, can we uh, get, can get boost his volume better? somehow? Can you hear me okay? Hello? It's light, but okay, continue. Do the best you can. Okay, yeah, I have full service on my phone. So I just want to express that I really appreciate the subcommittee getting together and putting together this fabulous uh, report. And 
it just goes to show the dedication of everybody here. It's very thorough. And it's this is a perfect subcommittee uh, report because this kind of ties into what I was saying about um, how we need once a month a creek cleanup crew. So the city needs to have, could have, once a month, right, a, a cleanup crew that goes to each crew, uh, creek and gets involved and cleans the creek. So I'm not sure how to uh, address this. I mean, I'm not sure Isabel or Sid or this, this Parks and Rec uh, Commission itself, I don't know if, d does a memo need to be drafted to get these volunteer groups up and running? I mean, does a memo need to be drafted for these volunteer groups to get back up and running? I know Isabel is trying to, you know, reamp everything as we get going after COVID, but how long is that going to take? I mean, where could we just draw the line and say, okay, hey, let's get these groups up and running. Let's post some postings on the, uh, the city's website or saying, hey, you know, we're, we have applications going for these groups, these volunteer groups, please apply, um, something like that. And also, has anybody reached out to the school districts? Because there's a bunch of students that would probably love to do this throughout the spring and throughout the summer break. Um, you know, so let's let's reach out to the schools. I know there's a meeting next week. I'll try to bring this up at the school board meeting. But I, I just wonder the process on this, right? I mean, does a memo actually need to be drafted and brought to city council for approval to get these volunteers up and running? Or can somebody just go ahead and, and take action in the moment and make this happen? So yeah, this is great. I, I'm really excited about this. Great job, uh, subcommittee. Did a wonderful job. And I think this is a solution to a lot of uh, things that are happening right now is these volunteer groups getting uh, up and running again. So congratulations. Uh, thank you for your hard work and dedication. And Thanks, I'm Jeremiah. <clears throat> um, is there anyone else? Yes. Letterman? Go ahead, Susan. Susan, you're muted. Yes, can you can you hear me now? Yeah, you're good now. So, except I've lost my video, but we'll live, we'll live with that. Yes. So once again, it's it's not possible really to comment intelligently on something you haven't seen, or at any rate, I can't do it. So my first suggestion to you in getting the community involved is to uh, make your reports available in in writing. I understand that this can be difficult. Uh, and this particular meeting, by the way, uh, of your commission was not on the uh, calendar. I tried to find out if there would be a, a meeting last week and could not find out. So just attending to little things like that might be a good idea. Uh, but be that as, I, I'm sorry, it sounds as if I'm being critical. At first blush, without thinking, at, thinking about it really, this looks like an excellent report. And I want to strongly recommend um, that bit about setting up a point of contact. I mentioned that there was a problem about telling people about this camp on Cerrito Creek where the people were really physically endangered by being in that camp for the rains. And so that point of contact really could have mattered. Um, and, and then about bringing back the, the Friends of Albany Parks. We just had a, a short uh, example of that before Pier Street Park was a park, but we knew it was going to be, we worked very hard to remove a particular invasive called stinkwort, which causes skin allergies. You don't want it in a park with children. And we felt we were done. It's not our usual work, and, but, but it has come back, not too surprisingly. Um, and we noticed it really too late this fall, and Albany was very good. We, they, they they got a truck down there and let us through the fence and we did the work in one day. I'm not criticizing anyone here, but this is a perfect opportunity to have that kind of community work party, get the neighbors involved in, in that. 
and they would probably come up with a stewardship group for that park and take care of this kind of thing. We, we got it too late. It has seeds. It's going to come back next year. Uh, so, yes, uh, I, I very much hope you will all do that and reserve the right to comment later when I've had a chance to think about what this report says. But it, it looks really good to me. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Susan. Do we have anyone else? Go ahead, Jackie. Oh, hi, it's Jackie. And I wanted to kind of clarify the question of meeting with the commission in the parks. Our Ocean View Community Organic Garden would like to meet with one member of the Public Works, one commission member, and our Recreation su Supervisor, Danielle, once or twice a year to keep up with our garden needs just like the Emeryville Community Organic Garden does. We thought that was a really good idea, and that's what we have in mind. Yes, we would do a report once a year at the commission as well. Thank you so much. I hope that's, I hope that's um, possible. And also, I would like to thank very much um, Julia and um, Angela for coming out in the rain to talk with us. We had a lot of fun. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Do we have more? No more. Okay, Commissioner Comments. Or actually, do, do the subcommittee members want to respond to the, or the, does anyone want to say anything about, no. Okay, any comments? I, I just thought the comment about having um, students involved is a good idea because my son was looking for, to fulfill his volunteer hours, like trying to scramble. And I feel like the city parks is such a meaningful way to contribute because he uses them all the time. So I would just really encourage if there's any way to intersect with some of the counselors at the middle school and high school, just to let them know about these friends, you know, eventually these opportunities. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess there was something I'd say about this request to meet with one commission member. It doesn't sound like a normal thing, but I mean, people can re can have relationships with individual commissioners, but it sounds more like maybe having the subcommittee meet with the individual group would be maybe the more appropriate uh, solution to this request, um, if we can work on it. But anyway, more, any other commissioner comments? I was just going to add that uh, apart from the work parties, the Friends of Albany Parks also had events where the community would come out and make requests and say, oh, we'd like to see this done and this done and this done. Mm -hmm. And that way you get a little buy-in as well. And that was usually done, I think, the month before the union had the work party. They kind of staggered. But every park, including like the Greenway, was hit once a year. Uh, and the they call these galas, galas, however you want to, and they weren't always so well attended. Um, Terrace Park would always get a good group, always get a good group, and uh, Memorial would usually get a pretty good, good group. But I went to a couple at Ocean View, no one was there, and things like that. But um, I like the idea of going out and, and asking for something positive rather than just we need your labor. <laughs> mm -hmm. Any other commissioners? So um, I guess. You know, my feeling about this is, um, you know, this is really awesome. This is, I mean, if every subcommittee and every commission promotes reports like this, I mean, this is, and, and case in point, how this really helps the discussion to have, have something like this up on the website. Um, I may have mentioned earlier, I kind of red flag this just one item, which is 3A-3. Um, the, the way it's written now, or at least the way I read it, it sounds like, you know, would have some major feasibility problems. But, uh, but it's obviously, this is just your first stab at it. So I think, and if the subcommittee is going to be continuing to meet uh, between now and our next meeting, I think maybe refining some of this three, because this really is the meet, you know, the communications really is, um, that's the whole thing. Um, yeah, so I would say, that would be a good direction to go in to expand on this. Um, and then as far as some of what people are asking for, um, I guess 
you know, when they're asking for a point of contact, um, I'm, no, I'm not sure that's really what they're asking for. I feel, I feel like really what they want is they want the homeless encampment gone, and that's not something that the point of contact can do because there's more involved. You, you can't just go out and remove the... So go ahead. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, I don't think it's always that. I mean, some, I know that the, the garden group have sometimes issues with, like, a lock is, you know, they normally getting... Um, repair on a gate, uh, irrigation, oh, it's just, it's just stuff it. like that. It's, it's, um, and actually, I think that group actually <laughs> has a good, a good contact, but I, I, I think that, um, yeah, it wasn't just always, it, it's just not always that issue. There's like a lot of issues that these groups want support with and, and want to know who would they go to. Um, yeah, and so, and then I think my, just my final comment is, um, I guess, you know, different people have different perspective on this. Um, we, we do need to make, you know, allowances and, and provisions to make use of these groups. Um, but for me, in terms of, there is a kind of a one vote per person principle. So, I know I'm just putting this out here. So when people come and speak at the commission, um, and we hear from one speaker who's part of a community group and one who's not, I'm not going to give greater weight to the one just because they're a part of a community group. Where they get their weight is from having more people show up and having a chance to discuss their and coordinate the communication. So I think ultimately, I mean, the success of these groups is going to come from showing up at the, these meetings. Um, but that said, you know, this, what the work you've done here is really going to do a lot to, to help. Um, you know, so that's what I have to say about it. Anyway, any other comments from commissioners? Um, I just, um, I, I appreciated, Isabel, your suggestion that there's something that could be agendized for the, you know, entire groups to come talk because we did encourage everyone to come to these meetings and give updates um, regularly. And, you know, I think many are interested in doing that, but it's a three minute comment and, and it's yeah. really, it's pretty short so I think having some opportunities um, annually for them to actually present and, and share what they're doing and, and I think one way we could do this and, and is um, to invite people to come do presentations like and just like how public works comes and does presentations you know we could um, invite these groups to do a presentation and, uh, and then we ha obviously we have to coordinate the schedule of when when there's opening in the commission meeting and when they're able to, but that would I would think would be a good way to do that. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think part of this is recognizing like the synergistic opportunities and bringing multiple groups together in one space to talk about shared experiences. You know, they're doing similar work in different spaces, and along with. Public Works and the city, and so there's just there's opportunity in actually having people kind of talking about those things together, rather than separately. What and I'm just slightly confused. What what forum is this then? That what when you say there's an opportunity for all to discuss this, then what what would the forum be then? Well, like Isabel suggested, it could be one of these meetings, but it's not just like agendizing those groups separately from each other in different commission meetings, but that maybe there's actually a single meeting that they're all coming to and have an opportunity to speak. Okay, so there's, in, in other words, there would be one meeting where one of our regular meetings might have the main topic might be community groups and we and then that's where I see the logistical problem is every finding a date when everybody can make it. Uh, sure. I mean, it's uh, all the power. If you could, we can do it, great. But yeah, and if I may tricky. interject, I don't think we need to figure out how yeah. this meeting would occur. But yeah. you know, we we can certainly think about it in the next few months and, exactly. and figure out the right format. Exactly. And in talking to the community groups, figuring out when what month you know what month would be better, and the, the, we can figure this out. I guess what I'm saying is that's going to be the challenge behind this item. Okay. Yeah, this co that coordination, and, and that's something great to do over the next th three months. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Oh, that's okay. Question. Uh, yeah. uh, how would, uh, when this comes back uh, in whatever pieces it comes back to the commission, how would, um, I think it'd be important to have 
uh, at least one like brainstorming session on what groups are out there or, or, or find out or have groups self-identify, although they may not know the meeting's even happening. So because there might be groups, for example, we've talked about uh, things like um, the dog park, the, where there are um, groups that maintain other cities' dog parks. Um, and uh, so we might have a group here that would want to do that or is already doing something anyway. Um, so how would we go about brainstorming what groups are out there? And who would be involved with these types of outreach? Well, I think through uh, the work that this subcommittee has done and through the Parks, Recreation, Open Space Master Plan, well, we did interview a lot of different groups. So I think we have a, a list uh, that we can pull from and invite people um, who are interested in coming and speaking to the commission. Okay, okay. That, that sounds, yeah, that's true. With the work groups listed in the Parks Master Plan, that sounds like a good start. And also this, this list here. Um, for something like the dog park, it hasn't been an official dog park with amenities yet, so, um, and maybe there's other spaces like that as well that it, there'd be a nice, it'd be good to have a mechanism to come up with groups that are not on this list or the Parks Master Plan. Thank you. That was good. Good one. I, I have a, a question for staff, kind of, I think, and, and it might be for, uh, generally. So uh, uh, I'm trying to, this, this really seems like guidance for staff. This doesn't seem like something that would make a proposal go to council for approval. This is pretty much just Yes. Staff look. Yes. I'm not asking for a lot of expenditures. It's just no. It's a I guidance it's for it's staff. Great. I just, and yeah. like I said, we will hold on to the document, okay. work on a lot of these uh, different uh, recommendations. As I meant, as I mentioned previously, friends of Albany Parks will come back uh, online uh, as you know as soon as we can. And I think through okay. that, a lot of that communication that may have you know fallen through the cracks over the land, or through, over the COVID period. Um, we'll just kind of reactivate and we'll be able to continue to uh, work with the community groups and, and increase our volunteering opportunities. And um, I think things will move along. It's just we haven't been able to focus on that aspect of the department's programming uh, just yet. So you, you folks are still down staff? How many? Uh, we, actually, I think we've just hired our last full-time okay. position, okay. And, so, yeah. uh, but of course we are, are in need of a lot of part-time staff yeah. as well. Thank you. Party over? Okay, do we, do we need to make any decisions or do we just kind of let the subcommittee go on their own? And Okay, yeah. I think continue I, I, your work. As, as I, I, I would even say, I, I don't, don't feel like you have to. I think this is great. So don't feel like we're saying this is inadequate. You haven't, you know. That's no, very helpful. It's great. It's great. I mean, what I would say, if, if you guys is, choose to, you know, expand you and to, refine. To, yes. Yeah, expand and refine. And particularly on that, that item, I was saying number three, you know, expand, refine, clarify, meet with more people, you know, whatever you want to do. But, um, yeah, and then we'll meet again in January. So um, the other subcommittees, so they didn't have anything on the on the, any reports. But did any of the other subcommittees have anything to talk about? Yeah, we, have, uh, we, have we had a quick, quick update. update. A report, okay. No, no report, but just yeah, we'll a verbal to, update. Yeah. Weekend update. <laughs> it's kind of fall, hard to follow that act, but we will. <laughs> yeah. Do I can go first. Or somebody else wants to. Because okay, I think we well, all I'll, I'll start. Places, yeah. So. Uh, like, um, we have the subcommittee on uh, on multi multiflex. Uh, well, basically, it's how to how to how to have more programming in our parks. So we have overlapping uses on a lot of the facilities. So in particular, multi-use uh, flex courts. And, and um, so we're uh, Isabel created. I've been working on this list of questions that Isabel had, and it's a fantastic list. I gotta say, and um, I'm just chipping into it a little bit now. But what I've looked into and the adjustable courts was we were just thinking that there might be something where you have the tennis court can be a pickleball and also maybe volleyball but there's so much more equipment out there there's there's of course the basketball loop hoops that can go up and down depending on little kid or adult so you can you're not stuck with an adult court or a kid court there's uh nets on, on 
cable so you can quad and off areas so you don't have balls bouncing off. It's good for uh, maybe batter's box or practicing golf and you contain it all. And that's a very simple setup. There's um, materials you can put down over the tennis courts so it actually reduces the amount of uh, repair on the, on the asphalt, but it's actually better for, for your, uh, your feet and your, and, your in, and your joints. And if you fall, it doesn't hurt as much and it's a better bounce activity for the kids because it bounces balls, bounce better. There were, um, and you can play hockey, you know, street kind of street hockey on there, or soccer, or tennis. Or, so it widens the capacity of using the court as opposed to just being asphalt. Or um, what's on the tennis court? It's asphalt, right? Yeah. So those are all kind of exciting, but they all come with cost and maintenance issues. Um, so then the next thing I'm trying to talk to some of the um, the recreational uh, uh, we call it the uh, parks and rec directors of different cities that have put in some of these multi-use courts and and what kind of maintenance issues they have. These are the questions you provided, and those are good. And who changes the equipment? The what I've learned so far is that the users do it themselves. You don't have to bring in uh, a city staff person to raise the net or lower the net. It's very easy. Um, so that's kind of where we're at at it. And um, yeah, more to add. <clears throat> yeah, it's actually great to have Chris on the team because he has so many, so many, so much experience with just parks in general. But um, so I got a recommendation for I talked to Lafayette, the city of Lafayette, and they have this rink that's a multi-use rink. It's amazing. It's like, <clears throat> I mean, we never we would be so lucky to have the space, but it actually has on it two basketball lined for two basketball courts, six pickleball courts, hockey and lacrosse. And but it's all shared. So you actually can't play <laughs> anyone at the same time. And I asked over and over again, like, how much staff time does it take? We don't have a big staff. And they said, no staff. I was talking to the recreation coordinator. He goes, no staff time. This, they just do it themselves. I mean, I think the thing is, is they really only have one net. It's pickleball, so you can imagine the usage because it's pickleball also. But the pickleball um, people have to bring in a net that's actually just it's a so it's a versatile like temporary net, and they put it back. But almost everything else is like the basketball hoops are just there. So there's only one piece that goes in and out. <clears throat> and it's really sort of like the honor system. You you had to use it, but even if they were left there for some reason because somebody was a little negligent, very easy to put away. So it was the same thing where they totally have um, the management be the users, and they haven't experienced complaints. But it was in the question. One of the questions that Isabel had was like, what was the process like of changing it? And so they did change it a couple years ago from <clears throat> before it was basketball, hockey, lacrosse. So it was always been multi-use, but they changed it to add the pickleball. And it was interesting. I said, oh, well, you know, how did you choose to do that? And I guess the guy just went to talk. They knew that they were going to resurface this court, and they thought, what else can we add? And so they talked to the city of Walnut Creek. So it was interesting. There wasn't even the pickleball like <laughs> advocacy. He just thought ahead and thought that might be a popular sport. And um, so I, it was one of those like build it, they will come, and like so many people started using it. So it really flipped it from an underutilized space to a very well utilized space. And you know when I talked to him about, I mean we can talk more when we finally do the summary. But I was wondering, you know, I told him, well, what we would be thinking about potentially is like you know a tennis court and adding something like volleyball and basketball. And he said, oh, if you're, do if you're not do converting to pickleball, <laughs> you don't even have any issues at all because he felt like the biggest issue they might have are time conflicts, if we, people want to use it at the same time. And he felt like the pickleball people used it in the morning and the soccer, basketball, hockey used in the afternoon, so it was generally not a conflict. But um, yeah, the recreation coordinator too said like, well, you just give the people those sports that have that veteran usage just let them always use it at that time that they're used to. You know, like reduce conflict by just having the, the, the default user still, you know, generally have the time that they need it for, and then people can work around that. So I think that's how they've sort of negotiated that. But um, anyway, it'll be, interest it'll be interesting when we get the full, all this information, because Chris and I are still looking, trying to get as many, you know, com interviews with city staff before we present the full 
Um, but also I talked with the sand volleyball advocate so just really quickly there. Um, and it was really good to talk to her, although she doesn't necessarily represent a group, but she did say that um, the Albany beach probably wouldn't work for sand volleyball. It's just too windy. So it's one of those things where like, oh, good to talk with somebody early on, because <laughs> no reason to go down that road if she's just like, that's a non-starter. Um, but I also told her, because I think one of the places she proposed was Memorial Park grass field. And I kind of told her that seems like a non-starter just because it's so well used. It would just take away too much other usage. So, you know, if there's a way to think about other spaces that aren't fully utilized or totally just dead space, but we just still have lawn there, you know, maybe maybe there, but I didn't promise anything. And, um, and she was very interested in a multi-use tennis court for volleyball. So even though sand is, you know, what she really is advocating for, she saw the utility of just having just more volleyball period. So... That's all we got for right now, but we'll have a fuller detail. Oh, and then I'm meeting with Dr. Well. I should let you. I'm meeting with Dr. Wells, superintendent, tomorrow morning, just to ask him, like, are you guys going to put the, you know, basketball hoops back in, et cetera, et cetera, and then let him know about this process. And so I think later we have to talk to athletic directors and others, and so he should just, you know, just to sort of give him a heads up. Um, so I don't know, Isabel, if you have any particular questions for him, or I can just give you my meeting notes afterwards. So. And then we're looking at um, Memorial Park in particular for certain things, with the tennis courts there and the, the baseball field there. But these are also uh, the ideas that can be used in you know, any uh, space that the city has control over. Um, and we have gotten information. We've reached out to just city staff. Like Isabel has provided um, the scheduling for the Memorial Park baseball field. And so that's helpful to see how it's utilized um, in the outfield. There's a lot of grassy area out there, and uh, some other cities do even paint, you know, stripe for youth soccer and things like that out there. Um, and uh, there's, um, and then we also have from Isabel the uh, a joint use agreement between the city and the schools uh, district. Uh, for the, what, what rights, I guess, the, the school district has for using city um, parks and fields and, and uh, structures. And so um, we'll be taking a look at that as well. And uh, as, as Julia said, talking to the superintendent himself, uh, to um, thinking about Memorial Park in particular, but like you know, spaces all over the city, um, how they could potentially um, use these, or if we put something new in somewhere, uh, thinking about m multiple uses. Anything else you guys wanted to add or said about it? I think that's about it for our update. Um, questions from the remaining commissioners? <laughs> um, no? Um, I have one. Um, I'm noticing the space here uh, doesn't look very... Could we just put a pickleball forward there? <laughs> uh, no audience. Um, okay, so I guess there's no action item on that. Um, I do have a comment. Go ahead. I have yeah, a question. I do have a comment, and, and I don't know. Uh, just just that uh, you know, sand volleyball. There's the space on Ocean View Park behind the, the picnic area that has that was intended for volleyball. Just put some sand there. It's cold. I think that's the problem with that. It's cold, but. I think it's yeah. got the post there. <laughs> yeah. I'm so sorry. I may have forgotten to check with you if there was public comment on the on the on any of these sub reports. Yeah. There's one so far. Okay. Well, let, let's let's in. I don't know. Were they hanging out since the first subcommittee report or the, on the second one? They commented on that. One. They commented on that. One. They, oh. No. It's just for this section. Yeah, okay. Well, I am because there were two commi two reports we had. That's what I meant. And they commented on the first one already. Yes. They did. Mm -hmm. That's what people are trying to say. Yeah, okay. Um, so there's, a, there's someone waiting now, though. Okay, so let's, okay, let's finish with the commissioners then. Or is there, did anyone else have questions then? Or, okay, oh, go ahead. Let them in. Hi. Hey, uh, Hi, my name is Philip uh, Moss. A um, couple comments about the pickleball. Unfortunately, I'm a pickleball player. Um, that the biggest problem for some of these pickleball players is we have to drag our own nets around. So if we could figure out a way to have nets, or at least one net on the conversion court at the park in a lockbox, 
so that people don't have to spend money to uh, to buy buy their own nets or, or haul their own nets around. That would be a big plus. Um, also, one of the things that you mentioned, I'll, I'll pick on Ocean View a little bit. Uh, the existing tennis court there on the east side could also be what's known as a futsal court instead of a soccer court. So when there's uh, wet fields are wet, uh, the kids can go out there and play futsal on the tennis court. So I, I want you to think about small-sided soccer, uh, basketball, tennis, and possibly a pickleball on that uh, east side um, tennis court. We have, and we're not going to cover it here, but what is, uh, next meeting I'm going to ask, what is going on with the pickleball courts on Ocean View? Uh, we were told September that is, uh, and then October, November, and now it's December, and there's still no meetings, design, input, anything on those. So, um, getting concerned again. And if you like, I can get a whole lot of people down there. So, I think that I I would not move a pickleball court down to uh, Thompson Park because it isolates one court from all the other courts. And pickleball players play in groups. We don't play individually at four at a time. And I think the excellent idea of what we use now is we use certain times that we use Castro and other parks, and then we turn it back over to the tennis players after we play. And we have set times we're doing that now. And that seems to work out fine. Well, that's all I had to say. Thank you. Um, was that the only comment, or is there another? There's one more. Yeah, thank you. This is Jeremiah. Uh, you know, I don't want to take up three minutes, but uh, I was just going to have just a positive suggestion. I'm not here to argue or disagree with anybody. Uh, I had forgot to actually mention in my earlier public comment, but. Uh, I was actually going to suggest. I was down at the Albany Bowl the other day, and there was a there was a there is a really nice location for a volleyball net down there. It's the most southern end. It's right by the the parking area. Uh, it's flat, and I know I know there's a wind, but I just wouldn't put all our eggs in one basket for one person to say, oh, it's too windy. It's automatic, no. I, I'd want to ask more people than just one. Because, and the reason why I say this is because, I don't know if anybody knows this, but since I graduated from Albany High School in 2001, Albany High School has the number one volleyball team in the entire world, as far as I'm concerned. I know I'm a little exaggerating right there, but... Albany's volleyball team is practically number one in the state. And I think more volleyball, the better. Because, okay, there's a little win, but that provides a little challenge. You know, it's, it provides a little challenge to the game. Sure, there might be a little win, but you got to learn how to play with the win. Right? It just it just expands growth. It provides a little, a little challenge, and I, I foresee Albany. You know, people, if not the youth, we should create some stuff for the youth to have a, a volleyball net down at the, the Albany uh, beach. I mean, I just I just wouldn't want to put a hundred percent no on it just yet, based off of, you know one person's opinion. Let's let's reach out to the school. Let's reach out to the students and say, hey, you know, we're thinking about putting a volleyball net at, at Albany Beach. There, it might be a little windy, but would you still play? You know, it, it just asks more people than just one person. So I, I, I'm not trying to um, create an argument or, or disagree with with the commissioner at all. I just I just want to just say, hey, you know. Let's just keep keep our options open and just don't have it be a definite no yet. Because 
because the win provides an extra challenge and it makes you know extra growth. So that's all I want to say. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Jeremiah. Um, is is are there more, or is it there isn't? Okay, we're like at the 15 minute mark, so I'm being careful. Um, okay, uh, does anyone want to respond to any of that stuff or no? I can respond to that. <clears throat> I agree that we don't need to, you know, roll out op options if sand volleyball is something that people want. Um, I did tell um, Izzy, who I spoke with, that wanted to know if she represented a group, and she said she didn't, but she did know of a lot of people like volleyball. So I think if there is a groundswell that, of interest, we should attend to that, but it didn't seem like that was the highest priority right at this moment. Sand, you know, the big contingent sand volleyball. The other thing <clears throat> I'd say about the um, pickleball, I just wanted to respond to Phillips. Um, the Lafayette, the pickleball um, community paid for their net. And um, it's in, so they paid for a very nice sort of portable net that is sited just outside with no lock. So the city does no maintenance. And they, you know, nobody, I mean, it's Lafayette, maybe it's different. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so they just pull it in and pull it out. But it's just for Philip to know that it was, it's the community that pays for it and maintains it. So if he's interested, I, you know, you could probably call the city of Lafayette and find out what net that is. But I think there was some former ones that weren't so good, but they found one that is hard, sturdy enough and that they use it without a problem. I had a res at least one response was uh, to the, um, for the, the net uh, question was uh, having a net on site that you can pull out is an improvement over having to haul your own net there. I agree with that. The city at Ocean View had a locked net um, that uh, you had to know the combination to get to it. Um, and so uh, that seems to me, you know, less, far less than ideal because then you can only have a few people with, that know the combination and uh, you can only have organized groups. It seems like to me you can't just have a family show up and play pickleball or you can't have just a few friends just show up and play pickleball because they don't know the combination. So, so I, I, we, we don't need to hash out all the details on all these little things here, um, but, uh, but that is, um, uh, you know, when some things on my mind in that Regard. Also, I hadn't heard of futsal, so I looked that up, and that that's something we'll take a look at. Um, and people mentioned Pierce Street Park uh, as being isolated, but imagine you only have space for one new, um, like one basketball court there, basically, or one tennis court. Uh, and now imagine you can have a basketball court and a tennis court and a volleyball court, you know, and and all these things in that one spot. Um, I think that would, and pickleball, and that would, I think that would energize uh, some of uh, Pier Street Park. Um, and uh, yeah. Okay, I think, you know, in, unless there's really a need to discuss this more, we may need to either have a motion to continue or, okay. Uh, great. Well, that was a great report. Um, so let's um, talk about. Future agenda items. Is there anything commissioners want on the January agenda? Um, does staff know what uh, will likely be on the next agenda? Uh, no, not at this time. And uh, do some commissioners know that they already won't be here for a next term? They're are not going to apply? That this might be their last meeting? Um, as was mentioned earlier, I have a feeling we're all going to be here in January Whether we because of the not. city council election <laughs> being delayed. There'll be no way that anyone could get a point. It's almost impossible by my calculation at this point. I was appointed on the day before Christmas when we had a normal election in this. Is it actually decided yet who's won? Or? There's a reorganization of the city council on Monday. Uh -huh. On Monday, so the new council will be uh, will have their first meeting on December nineteenth. Yeah. It, so, okay. It still might take them a while to wait, but okay. It depends. It sounds we, like we don't know. So basically, you'll hear from the city clerk. She'll let you know uh, when the application process will will open. If you're interested in staying on the commission, uh, you can reapply. Um, and then uh, you are asked to uh, attend the, next, the January meeting unless you are uh, replaced, basically. 
Okay. I had an agenda request. Oh, agenda great. Request. Thank you. Um, just if, I don't know if we could just get a very, <clears throat> very brief update on like the status of the dog park, status of pickleball court. Uh, Prop 68 kind of things, yeah. Yeah, just like where it's at, even if it's like we're still That's waiting for a response update. back, whatever it is. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. Okay. Well, um, let's see. So then I wanted to mention the next meeting is Thursday, January 12th. Uh, and again, some of us may be here, some of us may not. And that adjourns our meeting. Thank you. Thank you all.